The tax world of today is unlike the tax world of yesterday. And tomorrow will be different too. The role of tax is attracting attention like never before. As a tax leader, you're faced with a rapidly changing landscape. Shifts in compliance and regulatory obligations. Digital acceleration. New priorities. And the need to bring people together and boost performance. It's a new year with new optimism and a new reality. Are you ready? Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon or good evening, uh, wherever you are located. Welcome to our 2021 MISA virtual tax summit. Uh, very pleased to have everybody here today. Look, we would normally do this face to face in Dubai and, and, and get to meet 150, 200 of you. Obviously a different format due to the events that we're in at the present time, but it does give us an opportunity. We had over 900 people registered for this event uh, today and particularly with some of the um, uh, events over the weekend. Look, my name is Sean Chakrani. I'm the head of tax for KPMG in the Lower Gulf, which is the UAE and uh, Oman, and um, I will be leading you through the session here today. Um, let me just do a quick um, overview. Oh, sorry, a few things to note first. Um, so we, we want to try and make this as interactive as possible. So there is a Q&A tab on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, so please feel free to uh, put any, any, any questions that you would like our presenters to answer. And, and we'll try and pick up as many of those as we go through the sessions. Um, to the extent that we don't, um, there's more questions than the three hours allows, uh, we will be reverting back post event uh, with those answers to those queries. But please, um, uh, each, of the, um, each of the groups are happy to take questions as we go through. Um, at the end of the, um, uh, the, the at the end of the session today, there'll also be a feedback form, um, and we we do encourage you to fill that out. That helps us improve um, these sessions and and understand the content that people would like. Um, and just uh, for your information, uh, this is this webinar has been recorded, um, and will be shared with you after the webinar. Uh, one thing that's not on on this page also um, there is a there is a break. Um, halfway through. Uh, we do have some exhibitions um, and during the break there'll be a QR code where you can scan and enter into those exhibitions. So please uh, take that opportunity um, at that time and, and that, that QR code will be um, circulated um, to everybody after the session. Look, I, I won't go spend a lot of time on the agenda. Uh, it's, it's three hours. Uh, we've got a welcome address by Dr. Rashid. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. We have a keynote address. We've got some economists from EMBD who will give us an overview um, of the global and regional economic overview. Um, and then we've got three panels, one looking at the regional tax landscape, one looking at transfer pricing, and obviously they'll delve a little bit deeper into the OECD and best proposals that we, we learnt more about on the weekend. And then panel three, we'll talk about transformation, digital data. Um, and then we'll f f close with um, a, a short piece on the future attacks and, and and the things that we need to look out for over the next 12 or 18 months. But with that, what I will do is I'll pass to Dr. Rashid Al Kanani, who is the MISA tax leader, and um, to formally open the, the conference and to welcome everybody. Dr. Rashid. Thank you. Setting out the agenda, really appreciate it. Assalamu alaikum, welcome and good afternoon to all. Uh, we know, as the keyword said, this year is a little bit different. Our conference is virtual. Normally, we meet face to face. Hopefully, next year we will do it. So, 
We are truly honored to have you all with us today in the virtual MISA Tax Summit, and thank you for making the time and attending uh, the summit. Um, as you would agree, these are very interesting times uh, for tax and finance leaders across the world. We have been seeing tax functions adapting uh, to change uh, changes in the business landscape post COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there are notab notable de developments in the areas of VAT, transfer pricing, uh, the trade cost and customs, and to name a few. Um, as you are aware, um, uh, just as being uh, uh, there, there will be also not significant tax reforms arising from uh, changing. There will be uh, some uh, global development and the global development. And I'm sure you followed the news recently over the weekend, uh, and you've seen the press around the G7 group uh, uh, agreeing that the multinationals now uh, will be required to pay at least 15% global minimum tax uh, to end the race to the bottom in corporate taxation. This has been going on for a while, as you are aware, for multinationals. Now they just agreed 15%. And, and I've also seen in the regional press yesterday articles around the Middle East countries expected to follow the G7 group in, uh, of nations. And of course, we are following this major development with interest. And as you are aware, this is just came out just two, two, two days ago, and we are, we are following the development this very, very closely. With these uh, themes in mind, we have brought together an experience line uh, up of speakers, including senior tax leaders from prominent companies, uh, two well-known economists, as well as senior tax leaders from our global and regional network. We hope the next three hours will be insightful and uh, uh, help you in gaining more insight into the future of tax. Inshallah, next year, we are hopefully will be able to meet most of you in person. Uh, and of course, we are looking forward to speak to you later today during the closing discussions at the conference. Thank you very much and see you back. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rashid. Um, what I'd like to do now is, is move to the keynote address. Um, very pleased. Uh, to have David Linky here with us. David is our global head of tax and legal services. Uh, you also appreciate that uh, it'll be the second Australian accent that you hear um, in, in this early on in this conference. Um, but uh, David uh, took up that role October last year, and David, we'd love to get you out in the region and, and, and meet face to face, but very pleased that you could make the time to attend today and uh, hopefully. In the future, we'll um, we'll get to see you face to face in the region. But David, I'll pass that to you, and um, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Stuart, and and thank you, uh, Dr. Rashid. Um, it's good to be here today, um, and thank you for the invitation. And I I would like just to um, thank all our clients for attending. We we value the relationship with that we have with you. And as Dr. Rashid said, we'd love to um, meet face to face at some point in the future. But in the meantime, I hope that you and your families and your teams are safe and healthy. Today, I've just been asked to do a short presentation on a few key things. It's been a big week in, in, in tax, so I think we should talk about some of the global tax changes that were announced by the G7 um, over the weekend. I thought I should make some comments on transparency and where that's heading, and also the green agenda, which is a topic that a lot of our heads of tax and finance executives around the globe are quite focused on. I thought I should also just talk quickly about what that me might mean for um, tax reform in your part of the world, and then some final comments on, um, on what's on the uh, heads of tax agenda more generally. So, Renee, if we if we think about the G7 announcement over the weekend, and as I said, it's quite a big deal for global international tax. The announcement essentially pre uh, precipitates the need to reach an agreement when the G20 finance ministers meet in Venice in July. And it's an important announcement from the G7 in two respects. In terms of pillar one, there's an agreement that, that the US in particular, but other countries will give up 
the right to tax certain profits in the destination country or the market country in which goods are sold or delivered. In particular, though, conditional upon countries agreeing not to level, a, level a, di a levy, a digital services tax. The second point, which Dr. Rashid alluded to, is a global minimum tax of at least 15%. And the proposition is that that would be on a country by country basis. So they're quite significant changes, not simply for our global multinational clients, but also for governments in terms of how you might respond to these measures and what it means for future reform. And while they're the big announcements, I think there's a, we need to acknowledge that there's a few things still to be debated. The first thing is what's the size of the global companies that will be impacted? Clearly, uh, there's a debate to be had over the coming months where the US would like quite a significant threshold, where up to 100 uh, companies would be uh, included within the regime. On the other hand, the EU would prefer a threshold around the European seven, uh, the, the Euro 750 million mark, which would mean there could be up to 2,000 companies covered by the by the measure. So that's a matter still to be debated. There's this question still outstanding of um, natural resources and extractive industries. And what I mean by that is, is there a carve out? Now, we believe there will be a carve out uh, for the extractive industries and commodities, in particular, because it's necessary to get developing countries approval to the agreement. The question, though, as to what's happening with financial services is up for debate. Previously, it was thought that financial services would also be carved out, but that's that's a real debate to be had over the coming months. And then you'll notice in the in the agreement that was um, that was announced over the weekend, there's this question of, of what amount of the profit is allocated to the market country, and the proposition is that 10% is um, the normal um, expected profit, and therefore anything in excess of that is potentially the residual profit. And so the announcement talks about up to 20% of the profit in, in, in excess of that 10% margin would be allocated. So as you can appreciate, there's a number of matters still to be debated and worked through. But in particular, I think it has pretty significant implications for global international tax going forward, and in particular, how governments might respond to those measures. Um, thanks, Renee. The next, the next big trend I just wanted to talk about quickly was one of transparency. And, and I think there's a clear direction of travel here. You know, we've known that there's been exchanges of information between regulatory authorities and the common reporting standard for quite some time. And in particular, the extractive industries have really been leading the way in this regard for quite some time. But I think the World Economic Forum stakeholder white paper at the end of 2020 was important because it talked about disclosure of the total tax contribution for companies being publicly disclosed. And that was important for the US major multinationals. And I think the other thing that is happening is the EU has now reached provisional agreement on mandatory public country by country reporting. For EU companies um, and, and also companies that are headquartered elsewhere, that operate in the EU. Now, the key threshold there is um, turnover of greater than Euro $750 million. And so I think, um, you know, in terms of global multinationals, they are facing greater transparency. And I think leaning into that challenge is one that I've spoken to a lot of heads of tax and finance executives around the globe. And in particular, the EU announcements are quite significant we anticipate that they will potentially be effective from the financial year 23, so not that far in the future. But the direction of travel, in my view, on transparency is clear. Thanks, Renee. The other interesting thing that we've been spending a lot of time on and talking to 
a lot of heads of tax and also finance executives is the impact of what the EU is doing in terms of the Green Deal and the ambition for a 55% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030. There's been a lot of time spent by the EU on a potential carbon border adjustment mechanism, which looks to tax or put a price on carbon for goods that are entering the EU from countries with less ambitious carbon targets. Now, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the US follows um, this regard and how other countries respond. The US has historically had a focus on tax credits and tax incentives, but there is growing, growing pressure from a number of investor groups and also governmental authorities to really make some significant moves in this area. And the question relevantly for this part of the world as well in the Middle East is, is what's the response to potential EU um, imposition of carbon border adjustment mechanisms? Thanks, Renee. In terms of, um, and I know, you know, Dr. Rashid and Stuart and the team we have there will be um, across much of the tax reform detail and how it potentially impacts your business, much more so than, than myself. But it, in terms of my discussions with Dr. Rashid and Stuart, it's clear to me there's a number of developments under consideration in the region, the potential introduction of VAT in Qatar and Kuwait, personal income tax in Oman. The, the interesting issue with a global minimum tax is where does that leave incentives or tax concessions for interest, uh, for example, in free trade zones? That is an outstanding issue. And, and if you think about it, that may precipitate um, a move to direct grants or a move to various incentives that aren't in the form of corporate tax relief. Um, but but there's a there's quite a deal of reform, and I suspect, um, you know, in my discussions with Dr. Rashid and others, the global minimum tax announcements will simply accelerate that reform. Um, I think I think there's a clear direction of travel that um, if there's a global minimum tax of 15 percent, then countries need a robust corporate tax system to, in a sense, meet that challenge. Thanks. The other matters that are really on the minds of the heads of tax and finance executives as I talk to them around the world really, I suppose, fall into four buckets. The first one is the ongoing digitalization of tax lodgements and how heads of tax really get comfort on their tax position globally. And this is not, real, not only just a discussion for the authorities, many of the authorities are moving down um, the direct feed of um, tax data and working how that might work. But also companies are thinking about how the use of data analytics on tax information can really drive better decision-making across the business. And we're, we're spending a lot of time with our clients on that particular issue. I think disputes and, and also the management of the risk framework are really things that are on people's mind as well. We anticipate from our discussions with governments around the globe that as countries emerge from the COVID pandemic, there really will be a, a pressure on increasing tax take and increasing tax rates. And therefore this will of course give rise to further disputes which will need to be managed. And having a good sense of where those disputes might emerge, how they're being managed, and ensuring that the right control mechanisms are in place is really important. And I think the other thing that we're seeing, particularly in Europe, but I believe this will be around the globe as well, is the tax governance frameworks and what investor groups and also active social justice networks and other activist groups are seeking in relation to tax. They're seeking a disclosure of the principles and the tax strategy and how that fits in a sense with the purpose of the organisation and how you manage disputes and in particular what disputes are on foot and how you know heads of tax lean into that challenge and really do get that narrative right not only for their internal stakeholders, the CEO and the CFO, 
the board of directors, but also the external market is really important. And I think in my discussions over the last year, there's been some really good examples of companies, um, particularly in the extractive industries, which have really got that narrative really, really, you know, well honed. And I think that's a credit to them. So they're the four areas that I thought were front of mind for the heads of tax, um, and also the matters that that you know in my discussions with clients around the globe are really front of mind. Thank you, Stuart. No, thank, thanks, David. And look, um, actually, we've just got one question that's come in the Q and A, and I, I won't pass that to you, David, because I know that's going to be covered uh, in session two later today. But but one question that does come up when we talk about these these proposals that that, that uh, the G seven uh, signed off well you know initiated on the on the weekend is a lot of a lot of us operate in jurisdictions we're not in G seven we're not G twenty we're not even OECD so how likely is you know there's still a fair bit of water to to, to go under the bridge how likely do you think that the, the will this come in and if so what do you think the time frame would be <laughs> it's a very good question Stuart look I mean I. Um, my sense is um, that an agreement on these matters is now more likely. Um, I think I think um, the G7's clearly worked hard to iron out, um, you know, in an in principle agreement with some matters to be worked through in terms of detail. I think the OECD and the G20 um, now see a way through it. I think there's still the, some work to do on, um, you know, countries that are not part of. Um, of, of those particular groups and, for example, you know, some of the countries that are represented on this call. And I think that, you know, the the, the parties involved, Stuart, are acutely aware of, of getting the agreement of those countries. I think the natural resource carve out is a key element of that as well. So, you know, if you're asking me now, um, absolutely, I think it's more likely. Um, and therefore we'll get an agreement and therefore we'll have to front into it and deal with it and governments around the globe will need to think about how they respond. Um, you look, at the moment I haven't been able to go back to my people to work out exactly when it will be, um, you know, introduced, but I think 18 months was a reasonable time frame prior to the G7 announcement that we were talking about, Stuart, so I haven't heard anything at the moment which would suggest that that was still not a reasonable time frame. Okay, no, thank you, David. I appreciate it, um, and thanks for that, Dashan. Um, what we move on to now is uh, we'll move on to the the uh, panel one, um, and we're going to look at the regional tax landscape. And I'm going to be joined, um, uh, and I'll be moderating this panel. And I'm going to be joined by Howard Hull. He's a Group Tax Director at Alpha Tain Group. Um, uh, Chris Scott who's Head of Tax and Legal KPMG EMA, which is Europe, Middle East and Africa, and Cameron Butt, who is the Head of Tax in uh, KPMG Pakistan. So we're, we're going to drill down on, on some of the, the big issues that uh, came out of uh, David's uh, keynote address. And I might start with you, Chris. I mean, David set out three big global trends, and I suppose uh, we just wanted to pick up on two of those, uh, you know, the, the pillar one and the pillar two that we, that we heard about uh, the G7 talk about on the weekend. Um, and before we look at how that might apply in our region, maybe some um, insights that you, what you're seeing globally and what lessons could be learnt uh, regionally in respect of those, Chris. Yeah, well, thank you, Stuart. And hi, everyone. Um, good to be with you. Um, yeah, so, so let's take each of those in turn. Firstly, the BEPS program, and then, then secondly, the, the, the transparency aspects. Um, I mean, David, set out for us a, a good overview of the, uh, the, the, the state of play on, on the BEPS program and, and in particular the news this weekend. So I just wanted to look maybe at some of the more practical aspects and what we're seeing uh, our clients do in, in response to these developments. And, and if we just start with the BEPS 1 program, I think, I think it's worth not forgetting about that in all the discussion of BEPS 2, um, because there's still a lot of work to be done in, in turning the, the BEPS actions into domestic legislation around the world, um, let alone seeing how that plays out as um, tax authorities and taxpayers start to discuss what that means for, for individual individual situations. Um, and so, you know, whilst we see that play out, what, what specifically is happening? Um, in, in one, 
two areas I'd, I'd talk about. The first is that we, we have seen a lot of groups look at their, their international structures. So a lot of the BEPS actions are, are around ensuring there is sufficient substance and that certain arrangements um, you know, meet, meet uh, the expectations for, for appropriate um, structuring. So, so we've seen groups look at, um, for example, the substance they have in their holding locations or their, their IP or treasury companies and, and looking at if they do have any, any particularly tax advantageous arrangements, do they meet the new standards or will they need to change? So a lot of work around that area. And then the other area which David touched on as well is that a lot of a lot of the people I talk to are betting on the fact that there will be a rise in, in controversy and disputes in the next few years as these changes play their way through the system. Tax authorities think about what it means for the, the, their rights to tax different structures and arrangements. So uh, what are companies doing in respect to that? Well, I think one development which is quite notable is uh, seeing a rise in the appointment of, of somebody to the, the role of head of tax controversy or, or disputes within the company tax function. Uh, and that's with a view to ensuring that, that as disputes do arise around the world, they're handled in a consistent way so that the group is, is, is uh, articulated a consistent approach across different countries. That's important in its own right, of course, but, but it's also because of uh, the, the increase in, in the sharing of information uh, which David noted as well, the, the increase in share of information between tax authorities. So, so, so that's, that's a couple of observations on BEPS 1. Um, BEPS 2, again, it's, it's early days. They, David set that out. Um, it looks like it is, it is going to happen now, given, given the, 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 the G7 agreement and the momentum for change. Uh, what we have been seeing, and I'm, I'm sure this will continue now that there seems to be some shape coming around it, is that groups are starting to look at modelling the impact on, on their tax profile and their group effective tax rate to try and understand what these changes might mean for that um, and whether it, that might lead to any, any further changes that they need to, to, to put in place for, for, their, for their group. So, you know, I think that's worth the audience thinking about is, is, is starting to assess the impact here, discuss that with your CFOs, your boards, and start to, to understand whether, whether any changes may be warranted um, due to due to the, the BEPS 2 program. Um, the second point I'd make is, you know, we've seen the agreements is that digital service type taxes will fall away as the new rules are implemented. Uh, that was part of the political agreement. It's just worth remembering that there are already a number of digital services taxes in place around the world. And so, um, you know, we mustn't forget we have to deal with those while they do exist. And, and then time will tell how many of those uh, do get removed under this political compromise or how many survive in one form or another. So, so a few observations there on BEPS. In terms of transparency, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I think of transparency as the other side of the coin, if you like, of the, the changes to the international tax rules, because alongside changing the tax rules to seek to minimise opportunities for companies to arbitrage differences between country tax regimes, uh, the, the transparency trend is is seeking to change behaviours by um, increasing the reputational risk on on companies if if they pursue what what might be perceived as irresponsible tax behaviours. Um, and and there's a number of different elements to transparency in my mind, which which I think it's worth remembering when, when we think about what we've got to deal with this, because I, I think there's there's private transparency as well as public transparency. Um, and when I talk about private transparency, I'm, I mean the, the, the rise in reporting to tax authorities of the, the detail of the, the, the transactions that you undertake as corporate. So country by country reporting is a big one, and we've had that for a, a number of years. But it, the other big development is, is the increasing number of countries that are introducing regulation around mandatory disclosure regimes. So that was envisaged by Action 12 of BEPS. Uh, so the, the big move there in, in the last couple of years has been the EU. So we now have uh, mandatory reporting of aggressive tax planning transactions across the EU. Argentina and Mexico, for example, have just implemented it. Canada have announced proposals. Uh, Norway, South Africa, I think, have announced proposals as well. So we, we are going to see an increase in, in the nature of that reporting and, and more and more provisions for that in countries around the world, which we have to, to look out for. 
Uh, but then turning back to the question of public transparency, David gave the news about the development in, in the EU on public C by C, so I won't say any more about that. Um, the, the, the observation I make on public transparency is that um, there has already been quite a lot of voluntary transparency by, by a number of groups around the world. David referred to the extractive industries, uh, but we see it in other sectors as well. And, and, and what's driving that trend is this, this desire of companies to get on the front foot around articulating to, uh, to tax authorities and other stakeholders um, what their approach to responsible tax management is and, and to articulate just how much they are contributing to tax revenues and the administration of the tax system in the countries in which they operate. So, you know, I think that's something interesting to reflect on as well, um, given given the, the current political environment around around taxation. So, so just a few observations there, there Stuart, on, on some practical aspects coming out of the, these, these developments that David talked about. No, thanks, Chris. And um, what I might do is I might ask Howard, Howard, you, we've heard David's view of the likely timing and the likely success of implementation, particularly in this region where, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're not all members of the G20 or the OECD, and as uh, somebody here, you know, operating in the in the in the tax environment in, in the region, yeah. You know, what are your thoughts on 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 what Chris and David have just presented, and and how should we be dealing with that, yeah, you know, practically in the region, Howard? Thank you, Stuart. I think that uh, you know over the last eighteen months, a lot of heads of tax, a lot of tax directors have been chasing the fiscal stimulus measures. So you know, think about the government subsidies, the uh, the uh, the tax relief, be that uh, you know cash flow relief or, or uh, cash tax relief, and even before the uh, news over the weekend, uh, we knew that somebody was going to have to pay for this. So going forward, we're going to see more taxes, more transparency, and um, and definitely more more audits. I think uh, over the weekend, very clearly, I was interested to see the allocation of taxable income you know, for, the, for the GAFI plus companies, but more interested in the global minimum tax and the policy response that we can expect in some of the lower tax jurisdictions in, in, in the region. But I think you know, time will tell how this plays out and, and it will take time. Uh, I think David and, and, and Chris mentioned this very clearly already. So there will be time for you know, getting the organizations right, tax organizations, uh, compliance and, and controls right. But because this is at the forefront of people's minds, including the board and the C-suite, now is a good opportunity to uh, see how we face that uncertainty um, from a, uh, a planning perspective, uh, not just reactive, not just looking at the tax impact, you know, your ETR, uh, calculations that uh, you know are so you know easy these days with the CBCR data that we all have access to, but also the tax optimization. And I do mean tax optimization. It's it's the holding, the, the financing, and the the operating of businesses, um, you know, within the limits of you know risk management and, and bets in particular, uh, in a in a way that's sustainable, irrespective of uh, what is thrown. Our way, Stuart. Yeah, no, thanks, Howard. And, and look, a lot of the talk um, has been around Pillar 2 and the, the minimum rate of tax. Um, what are your thoughts? So, and we don't hear a lot about the Pillar 1 uh, proposals in this region, but what are your personal thoughts on Pillar 1 and the impact of the region as well? Well, I think very clearly it depends on how broad the scope of Pillar 1 will be. The allocation of taxable income for these uh, high-tech and, and other IP-driven entities, uh, whether it's going to be the, the, the GAFI plus, plus 100 or, the, um, or the, uh, the, the 2000 that we heard David speaking about, it's going to be, have a very different impact uh, on uh, companies in, in this region. Uh, very clearly, however, when we look at the allocation of taxable income based on where consumers are, this shifts, shifts a little bit what corporate income tax is all about. I mean, you know, historically, uh, corporate income tax was something you did once a year based on financial statements that you got by your auditors, you did some adjustments, and off it went to the authorities. But if now you're going to have to track 
uh, on a transaction by transaction basis where you have these um, th these customers, we're getting much more akin to a, 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 a transaction type tax uh, that, than, than a corporate income tax. Um, very clearly, I do recognize that um, it is the tax base that will be the messy part in all this. Uh, 15 or wherever they land on the, on the tax rate is one thing, but, but the tax base is going to be the messy part. So time will tell to see how businesses, but also policymakers, um, adapt to this new environment. Oh, no, thanks, Hal. Thanks. Yeah. And look, I'll just put us to Cameron. Cameron, um, we've, we've heard about uh, from Howard, the impact we suppose we're focused on the, the GCC region. You, you're representing the South Asia region, uh, where we've got a more developed tax administration and tax law uh, environment. Keen to get your thoughts on the impact of these changes for the Southeast Asia region and what likely changes are we going to see in the future? Sorry, South Asian, I should say. Come on, you're, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Come on, that's perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you, Stuart. And uh, I am delighted to be with the panel. And uh, as uh, Chris mentioned, you know, uh, about the bill one, embracing the BAPS initiative in South Asia, the governments have inserted suitable provisions in the respective statutes. For example, the transaction between associates requiring taxpayers to maintain master file, local file, and for country by country reporting. Uh, there is a uh, taxation with regard to thin capitalization, taxation of excess in trust claims, uh, taxation of cohesive business arrangements, that is taxing offshore and onshore portions combined together, taxation of return on investments under controlled foreign company provisions, taxation of gain on disposal of assets outside the country, uh, introduction of automatic exchange of information, Pakistan has uh, adopted the global standard for automatic exchange of financial account information in tax matters, which are commonly known as CRS, as developed by the OECD, and has also been hosting a dedicated portal on, on for this. Sri Lanka and Bangladesh are likely to uh, sign off the CRS standards shortly. Uh, uh, there's a digital on the digital taxation front. Uh, so, so there are rules in place which requires that uh, the, and the digital service providers, which have virtual presence, they have to pay their VAT, file tax, uh, VAT tax returns. And also from the federal tax point of view, from the corporate tax point of view, uh, the government has imposed 5% tax uh, on their uh, gross income, uh, which a pair has to be the whole. So there is a lot of debate going on this and uh, a lot more uh, you know, uh, controversies to be uh, seen between the taxpayer and the tax collector on this front because on, on the federal taxes, uh, at the moment, nobody is filing uh, the federal tax return, uh, uh, the digital tax provider providers, uh, because uh, they feel that, you know, they don't have a permanent establishment uh, in the country and they can trick, take the treaty benefit. So that is still to be seen that how it, how it settles down, but the tax authorities are finding a ways to uh, to get the information from the banks, uh, from the taxpayers, uh, to see that what is the volume and how can they uh, bring them in the tax net. Uh, on, on, on transparency front, the OECD trying to create greater transparency with C by C reporting rules and a much, uh, a much tighter anti-avoidance agenda, along with the local measures from national tax authorities have put the spotlight on tax as one of the moral issues of our time. As such, there is an increased focus on this, and on this course, certain initiatives have been taken. For example, introduction of anti-money laundering provisions under FATF, uh, whereby accountants, real estate agents, and jewelers have been made liable to register as designated non-finance businesses and professions. They need to do the KYC of their existing and potential customers as to their background and uh, the nature of source of their income. And, and hopefully the lawyers we are hearing, they are the next in line. Uh, 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 in, in, with regard to transparency again, 
uh, the government has been, uh, made it mandatory filing of online appeals and also uh, the online hearings. Uh, this is also done in, in particularly uh, keeping in view the COVID circumstances. You know? So they have uh, uh, restricted uh, the assess of taxpayers to the tax authorities. So they want them to be to utilize that digital space and 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 also for the for the transparency of the hearings, uh, which is a good sign, I I believe, uh, because uh, you know uh, the more the interaction between tax collector and tax authorities is reduced, there is a greater transparency and you know the 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 uh, concerns of the taxpayers would be addressed. Uh, uh, another area where the government is trying to uh, um, uh, make certain transactions transparent is that is by implementing track and trace system. Uh, for certain industries, for example, tobacco, uh, cement, fertilizer, and sugar. And effective from 1st July 21, these products should not be allowed to be removed from production or import station without fixation of a unique identification mark to be obtained from the government approved suppliers. Uh, in respect of Pillar 2, as uh, Chris mentioned, um, uh, more changes are likely to be incorporated the local statutes and as and when they are finalized, uh, which are expected probably next month. Thank you. Over to you, Stuart. Yeah, thanks, Cameron. That's, that's great. Um, uh, just conscious of time and, and Chris, we'll just move on to the, the, the third trend. And, and uh, you know, we, we heard uh, around the green agenda of the ES agenda. Um, and again, if you can maybe just um, give an overview of what you're seeing as you talk to you used to travel around the world, but if you if you talk to people around the world now, Chris, and um, and and then we will expand out and sort of see what 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 lessons we can learn for the region here. And Chris, you're still on mute. I beg your pardon. We realise I've got myself <laughs> back on, on on mute. Um, uh, so, so yeah. So when when we talk about the green agenda, I think it's worth thinking about about the the, the broader aspect of this, which is um, which is the ESG agenda more broadly, um, because uh, you know a lot of a lot of organisations now are, are are responding to that agenda. So what is the ESG agenda? Well, the ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance, and, and these have really become the three pillars through which companies are thinking about and acting on the, the contribution they make to the societies in which they operate. So just, let's just look quickly at each of these in turn. Um, the environmental pillar, well, that, that's the green agenda, as, as David put it. So this is how a company is contributing to the sustainability and climate change agenda. And clearly, our, our companies are doing that in the way they operate. Um, and there will be taxation issues that come from, from the changes that we implement. But in pure tax terms, we can think about the, the, the carbon and green related taxes. David talked about CBAM in, in, in the EU, but there, there will be many others, I believe, that come into come into force in, in, in the next number of years because taxes are, of course, a great way of driving behaviours through through giving different incentives. So, you know, as tax leaders in our companies, we'll need to, to keep a track of these taxes as they come into play and think about how they impact uh, our own businesses. Um, the second pillar is social, and this is thinking more widely about the purpose of our, our companies as we operate in different countries around the world and how we contribute to those societies we operate in. So th this is where the tax transparency reporting comes in that we've talked about already. Um, as we discussed, um, companies are, are thinking now more clearly about how they articulate the contribution they make in the countries they operate in, and one of those big contributions is through the collection and, and payment of taxes. And that's where the tax transparency reporting piece comes in, which we're, we're all going to need to, to think about in the years ahead, I'm sure. And then finally, the governance pillar, that's about the structures companies put in place to ensure good governance over their operations and which will enable them to attain uh, the overall goals that they have under the ESG agenda. Um, so if we think about that in tax terms, uh, we think about uh clearly articulating and documenting the tax strategy that, that you have for your your company um and making sure that your tax operating model um is set up to deliver on that tax strategy and then being able to report and and, and, and articulate um execution against your strategy um 
put in broader terms, it's about showing that your corporations take a responsible approach to the manage, management of tax. So, so that's a brief overview of the ESG agenda and some of the touch points for tax. Um, you asked, you know, what are we seeing as we go around the world? I, I suppose one of the interesting questions is, is uh, whether the ESG agenda is, is something to do with a particular moment in time, politically in a certain part of the world, or, or whether it's, um, it is a a global phenomenon that, that we're all going to have to address at, at some point. And, and the reason I get that question is because I think there is a certain political environment in Europe at the moment where uh, the SEA agenda is front and centre of everything we think about and, and we're very actively pursuing that. Um, but, but I think it is a, it is, this is a global phenomenon. You know, I, I think all around the world we understand the challenge of, of climate change and that we, we have to change our behaviours to address that. So. So, so clearly that's a global phenomenon. But if we think about the social and governance aspects, and particularly as they relate to tax, look, many of these things were, were anticipated in, in the BEPS One Actions Program, um, because a lot of that is about, is about good governance of tax and making sure companies contribute in the right way to the societies they operate in. So, so again, I would say that's clearly a global phenomenon and the, and the OECD project and the inclusive framework makes clear how many countries are engaged in that exercise. So I think, to, to me, it will clearly be a global phenomenon, but um, that, that's easy for me to say as an advisor, you know, close to these issues and, and coming from Europe. Um, it, it may be interesting to get the perspective of, of Howard on this as, as a, a tax director for, for a company in a different region. So, so Howard, what, what's your perspective on, on this issue? Sure, Chris. Um, you know, global phenomenon, phenomenon definitely. Um, this being said, I think uh, everybody's trying to do their part, uh, obviously within the limits of priorities. Different uh, countries and different companies in this region have, have different priorities. Um, what we all recognize, though, is uh, doing our part in the transition to net zero fair enough. You see some big initiatives. Think about um, the Expo, uh, the World Expo, kicking off in October of this year in, in Dubai, which is very, very focused on the ESG agenda. But also think about uh, some of the regulatory moves that have been taken recently, the Securities and Commodities Authority in the UAE requiring all listed companies to uh, um, do a, a, an ESG reporting uh, for 2020. So, you know, there's some so, so a lot of movement going on in this space. What I'd like to pick up on, though, Chris, is the, um, the G of the ESG, the governance. And I know you've mentioned it and, and David mentioned it earlier on, but I think this is a, a, an opportunity to really um, have more um, presence within within an organization from the tax function. Uh, so when I think about governance, I think about making sure there's a platform on a regular basis to get in front of the board or C-suite with, you know, you mentioned strategy, you know, making sure everybody's cognition to the risk appetite, which does change over time, um, the code of conduct, uh, but also policies. Now, what tax people tend to do, they focus on tax policies, okay? But what's just as powerful, if not more powerful, is focus on other policies, you know, going around the other functions within a, a group, be it HR, uh, legal, internal audits, uh, just to make sure that tax is embedded in every one of those policies. And little by little, by doing that exercise, you manage to you know, raise the profile of the issues that the head of tax faces on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, that is really helpful because when push comes to shove, you're going to need a budget, a budget to do those process improvements, those technological advancements in order to manage your risk, which at the end of the day is you know, what we're trying to do to, um, to sustain that um, reputational risk we were talking about earlier. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a really good point. It's, um, if you like, it's a good moment for tax professionals. I think, you know, all of these issues are absolutely top table issues now, and, and there's, there's an opportunity you know, for, for boards to hear our voice on them, I, I guess is what you're saying. And, and of course, that's, that's to the benefit of, of the companies we're, we're trying to support. So a really good observation there. Um, but, but just on the, on this this topic, Cameron, and the, the view from different parts of the world. What, what's your take on this, and particularly thinking about the, the countries across South Asia? Thank you, Chris. Thank you for defining 
partners uh, and who are expanding on it from DCC perspective. Uh, South Asia is also not uh, uh, you know, separate from the global, so they're also taking steps because the revenue authorities, you know, collect taxes from governments to, uh, to for, for governments to invest in hospitals, schools and roads, creating the social infrastructure that improves the lives of the communities and nations. So these three pillars gain significant uh, importance. Prior to COVID-19, it was the E of ESG that has been on everybody's lips. And post COVID, tax has become a key component in the S of ESG, and it also plays a significant part in the G. On environment front in Pakistan, Pakistan Environment Protection Agency is responsible for enforcement of the rules and regulations and approves the environmental impact assessment and initial environmental examination. Certain companies in Pakistan have been publishing reports covering separately and in combination the environment and social aspects of their operations, but such reporting is not mandatory uh, as yet. Government has allowed uh, a number of incentives for green initiatives, for example, companies investing in alternate energy projects like solar, wind power, incentive of import of electric vehicles, and also encouraging investment in developing environmental friendly smart cities. Uh, in Sri Lanka, there's an actual action plan for Green Lanka, which exists since 2009, and gov government is also promoting inclusive and concise corporate reporting of how entities create value through their business model, stakeholder engagement, and deployment of risk and governance processes to achieve sustainable development and, and related matters. In Bangladesh also, despite having a good number of environmental laws, policies, rules, regulations, which are currently six of them, the institutional base of environmental governance in Bangladesh continues to remain weak, fragmented, and is insufficient to meet the enormous environmental challenges the country faces in the future. Uh, on the social front, uh, in Pakistan, Securities Exchange Commission of Pakistan has issued a cease or order in 2009, which is applicable to all companies. The said order requires descriptive as well as monetary disclosure of CSR activities undertaken by companies, if any, during each financial year in the director's report to the shareholders, which is annexed to the uh, annual audit of accounts. Uh, and on governance uh, front, uh, again, the Securities Exchange Commission of Pakistan implemented a code of corporate governance in March 2002. It was revised in April 2012. The code is applicable uh, on all the listed companies and also on the issuers of the listed securities. Under the code, the board of directors of a listed company are required to ensure that company has a policy on corporate responsibility initiatives and other philanthropic activities, including donations, uh, charities, contributions, and other payments of similar nature. The code also states that the directors of the listed companies must be certified under the comprehensive director training program. One of the components of directors training program is to, is to make the directors aware of the international trend and practices in CSR and sustainability reporting. Uh, so to sum it up, the tax paying entities are now becoming increasingly focused on having the appropriate tax risk management and governance framework to ensure that material task risks are elevated to the board for consideration uh, in all of these three areas. Thank you and over to Chris uh, to you. Oh, no, 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 thanks, Cameron, and um, thanks very much for that. And uh, look, we've got, we've got a little bit of time just for a couple of questions. And uh, Howard, the first one's for you. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of changes over the last past 18 months, and it's been said there's a lot on the uh, upcoming agenda. How, in your role, uh, how do you deal that day to day, and how do you communicate that to your C suite or the board? And, and what recommendations can you give the participants on this call? But I think uh, one of the things that uh, I've found works quite well is putting together a tax control framework. Now, I know 
tax control frameworks are regulatory requirements in a lot of jurisdictions, but not so much in the, uh, the MESA area. Uh, but it's uh, always a good idea to have one of these. And, 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 you know, in a nutshell, what are you doing? You're making sure that, you know, your policies, your reporting, your tax operating model are all geared up to, you know, three things, you know, your, your opportunities, but your risks and, and your audits. And if you manage to, um, on a quarterly basis or a biannual basis, whatever it is, get in front of the decision makers within the organization, the ones that pull the budgets um, on risks, audits, and opportunities, whether it's strategic, management, or, or operational, uh, then uh, you have a, a very powerful tool in front of you. However, I have one caveat. I've seen a lot of these where you go into the meetings and you hear about the risks, opportunities, and audits, and it is for information purposes only. Well, that only gets you so far. Uh, if you have a tax control framework whereby you have a list of uh, decisions that are required from the board or the C-suite, uh, then you get the automatic buy-in uh, or not. Um, and you at least get uh, involvement from uh, those people, uh, which makes it so much easier when you have to explain that you need a process improvement or technology in order to manage those, those risks and those audits. Stuart? No, thank, thanks, Adam. Look, we're, we've come to the end of the time. There are a couple of other questions. We'll, 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 we'll get back to those um, uh, after the session, um, as we want to keep it, uh, you know, we want to keep we want to keep on on time. Um, we're gonna we're gonna gonna break here for ten minutes. Just give people a ten minute break. It'll be uh, and we'll come back at sort of three thirty UAE time. Um, so please uh, please you know take a break, grab a coffee. So uh, welcome back. Um, hope you uh, got yourself a coffee and refreshed uh, for the second uh, hour and a half. Um, hope you found the first hour and a half informative. Um, we're going to move on now. Um, uh, we've got two more panels, uh, and then we've got a, a wrap up and a, and a conclusion uh, at the end. So the two panels we're going to delve a little bit deeper into transfer pricing across a MISA perspective. Uh, we're going to have a panel on transformation, in a sort of focus on data and digital, um, and then we're going to sort of wrap it up with the, the sort of what we're calling the future of tax and, and some some key pointers, some key takeaways. Uh, from from today's session, so with that we're going to move on to um, uh, the transfer pricing, uh, MISA perspective, um, and I'm going to ask Shabana Begum, who is the UAE transfer pricing leader, to moderate this panel and introduce uh, the participants. Uh, Shabana, over to you. Thank you, Stuart. And welcome everybody to the Transfer Pricing Panel. My name is Shivana Begum. I'm going to be taking you through a few themes, some of which you've already talked, we've already discussed. Um, and before we do get into the detail, I just want to remind you that there are a couple of booths in the exhibition area, which you know would be great if you could go and have a look at. Um, one is the Digital Gateway, which is our tax technology platform. But the one that gets me really excited is our BEPS2 um, model. Now, for those of you who haven't seen this, this is a really snazzy way to look at what the impact of BEPS2 will be for your business, and it gives you a great dashboard results. Um, so if you haven't already, please do take some time out to, to have a look at these tools. Um, but without further ado, I would like to get on with the panel. And you know, whilst we have heard a lot about the um, some of the themes around, particularly the developments over the weekend, um, clearly, I do agree with some of the thoughts that were echoed around this being a great time to be a tax professional, particularly in the region. And if I touch on something that Howard actually mentioned in the previous session, which is, you know, this is really taxes opportunity, both tax and transfer pricing to really be on the board's agenda and to embed some of these, these key changes into you know, various processes and strategies that various different stakeholders are um, dealing with across the business. So I do think this is a unique time. Um, and we're going to be covering some of those developments in this 
in this panel as well. So to, to kind of kick this off, I'd like to introduce you to your distinguished speakers. So we do have representation from the network. So we have Stefan from KPMG in Saudi Arabia. We have Barbara from KPMG in Qatar. Majid is joining us from KPMG in Egypt. And then we have Shamala from KPMG in Sri Lanka, who will comment on the MISA, or particularly the South Asia perspective. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this um, presentation, we obviously have heard a lot of the themes around um, Pillar 2 in particular, um, or BEPS 2. Um, we've, we've heard a little bit about the EU public country by country reporting proposals as well, and this debate about tax transparency. And of course, there's a lot of non-tax issues that our businesses are dealing with as well. For example, the pandemic is still making its effect fully felt across a number of industries. So lots going on, and maybe if I start with Stefan, if you could give an overview of what you think you know, some of these key developments and what, what impact they are having for groups in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, thanks Sabana and welcome everybody to our TP panel. So yeah, uh, I've been in the region now for over 10 years and I can fairly say the last three years especially have been quite right in terms of developments and now we see tax even as making the headlines in the news so, so that's something that is uh, i would say news especially in in this part of of the of the world so if, if you want to break it down i think if, if you look at saudi specifically you see yes there is a specific developments around introducing tax regulation in general so 2018 we started with transfer pricing so transfer pricing being enforced requiring you to not only prepare a local file and the master file, but also already in your tax return to prepare certain information so that the, the tax authorities can have a first look and the first assessment on what is your transfer pricing footprint. So then we see now the e-invoicing coming up. So another requirement for you to not only reorganize uh, your, your finance function, but also to think about how am I dealing with all this, this uh, data going forward. So I would say if, if you want to summarize it, so the, the, the main question is how can I make sure that tax is not anymore like a side project of my finance team? Because that let's be honest, that that's what happened a lot in in um, organizations within the Middle East because tax was not really on, on the agenda yet. But now I, I think with all the regulations coming in and of course we talked about uh, the UE already talked about, or Barbara will be speak about Qatar in, in a couple of minutes. So we see that all the countries are moving into the same direction, which is getting information, give us information, we do an assessment based on this information. So um, I think what we need to make people aware is that they need to start of thinking of putting the right people into their organization, introducing tech specialists into their organization to make sure that they are handling this risk also from from a, from an organization perspective because it's not only about the, the penalties that that you may be exposed to it's also a lot about reputation so so what am i doing there is this the right way to do it? and the right way in this case i don't think always means the the legal way but it now has also a moral component to it so so i think that's something that that also is is quite interesting for for organizations so that's that's something that we need to need to be aware about just just to make sure that our organization is moving into the right direction in the future. Thank you, Stefan. So I think key, clear themes around you know, transparency, around reputational risk, making sure those processes are done in the right way. And importantly, you say morally right way. Um, clearly, this has been a, you know, discussed to death in many parts of the world, in Europe in particular, around corporations paying their fair share of tax. But I certainly see that theme also repeating here. Barbara, do, would you say it's similar in Qatar or are there different themes groups are dealing with? Um, thank you, Shabana, and welcome to everybody. I think it's very, um, you know, maybe specific to Qatar that um, uh, the driver to adopt international tax development here in Qatar is less the short term or mid term uh, financial need. So it's much more the desire to be compliant with international tax compliance and by all means to avoid appearing on the blacklists of this world. And all of this has led to a huge change in the last of couple of years in Qatar. So first of all, a new tax authority has been established 
And now a new quite sophisticated tax platform, the RIBA, it's the name, has been implemented. Uh, a lot of new reporting requirements such as FATCA, CRS, country by country reporting, transfer pricing, but also contract reporting has been introduced. But maybe the biggest change of all this is that in Qatar, the tax authorities have now started to look into all this information and really, you know, to, to issue assessments, to ask questions. And I think that's probably the biggest change. Um, but you also have asked about the non-tax development. And there, what I see probably the biggest impact is that the companies here in Qatar and probably also in the region, they became used to employees working from abroad and they are actually now actively considering to continue this for cost reasons or maybe also just to simply be a good employer and they want to keep this uh, going forward and there even if the tax authorities around the world they have sh sh shown some some flexibility or they were quite relaxed uh, with those facts during the pandemic I'm sure that this will change and I really expect a lot of discussions around transfer pricing and PEs in this respect in the future. And I think that's the challenge, isn't it? It's the fact that knowing this flexible working, this new world is going to create so many more transfer pricing you know, issues, audit issues, as well as international tax issues, agreed. And I think if I just take a moment to reflect on what this means for the lower world, and in particular the UAE, I mean, I, I agree, you know, I think some of the, the points are very specific as well to the UAE. So, for example, this idea of the tax authorities becoming much more um, well-rounded and you know um, addressing not just VAT for example we've had VAT in the UAE for the past three years but clearly it's becoming we are expecting more questions on ESR related activities for example which clearly has a link to transfer pricing so I think you know we see the change from the tax authorities here in the UAE um, and I think clients are also and I you know I've lost count of how many clients say to me we don't want to be doing anything illegal but we want to be tax efficient and we've always managed that in the UAE but clearly things have changed and there are a number of reporting requirements so I agree I think the whole the debate around tax has completely widened and transfer pricing in particular has widened and for a country that doesn't have transfer pricing right now in the UAE it's a very interesting place to be because whether it's C by C whether it's ESR you know the old customs there's transfer pricing linkages in every single one of those disciplines so it's certainly an interesting time Thank you for that, Barbara. Um, so in terms of, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about the international developments, but this is, you know, a very much a regional conversation as well. And we are aware that there's been a number of regional developments, um, particularly Egypt, Qatar, and obviously Sri Lanka as well from a transfer pricing perspective. So Majid, perhaps if I turn to you um, from an Egyptian perspective, you know, a lot of groups obviously have presence in Egypt when they are headquartered in the Middle East or even outside. Um, and they are, they found it difficult in the past to deal with Egypt. So is there any kind of insights you can share in terms of the current regulations and what groups can expect given the recent changes last year? Yeah, thank you, Shavana. Of course, uh, we have uh, recent developments uh, within the last two years uh, regarding the transfer pricing studies where it was indicated that any person that has financial and commercial transactions with the related parties would be required to declare the transactions in their annual tax return and they have to file the transfer pricing documentations which are the master file local file and country by country reporting the there will be of course a threshold required uh, for the master file and the local file which is 8 million egyptian pounds and it is 3 billion uh, egyptian pounds in respect of the country by country reporting uh, the master file is required to be filed within the same date on which the uh, 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 the master file is filed by the head office or the parent company in the country of residence. If the parent company is located outside of Egypt, of course, if the parent company is located inside of Egypt, then you have two months following uh, the deadline for filing the tax return in order to file the uh, local file and the master file. Uh, uh, again, uh, of course, uh, there will be uh, penalties, you can say, associated with non-filing of these uh, uh, documents. Uh, for example, if uh, you will not declare the transactions within your tax return, 
then you are required to, to uh, pay 1% out of, of the total uh, value of the transaction uh, in case of non-compliance. And the same uh, in respect of non-filing of the local uh, file or the master file where you have to pay 3% out of the total value of the transaction. And from a, a CDCR perspective, you have to pay 2% out of the total value of the transaction. Thank you. And Marjan, you know, it's always useful to hear about the, the deadlines and the requirements, but in terms of practical challenges that you're seeing groups deal with in Egypt from an audit perspective, could you give us a summary of what they are? Uh, frankly speaking, uh, you know, most of the uh, taxpayers uh, who maintain transactions with uh, related parties, they are audited currently by the Egyptian tax authority where the tax authorities scrutinize these transactions they review the uh, transfer pricing methods, uh, uh, you know, uh, that is applied by each uh, taxpayer. And then uh, if they are satisfied, that would be fine. But if they are not, then they make their own adjustments. And this is uh, done separately where they are reviewing the taxpayers from a transfer pricing uh, uh, perspective separately. Uh, you know, it is not uh, subject to income tax. Uh, still, you are required to uh, to be reviewed from a transfer pricing perspective. Thank you, Majid. Okay. And Barbara, there's clearly a lot of noise in Qatar um, from the recent regulations, and I, I think it's keeping quite a few of us busy from a June deadline perspective. But could you give us some? insights as to, you know, those key key changes and the requirements in the next few months for groups in Qatar? Sure, more than happy. So, you know, while uh, transfer pricing was actually or is present in Qatar already since 2010, when the arm's length principle has been embedded in the law, uh, the TP reporting requirements has just been recently introduced. And this is actually the first uh, year where we really have to, to, to fight. So, first of all, maybe companies in Qatar need to file a TP declaration together with their tax returns if they have a total revenue or total assets above 10, 10 million Qatar Rial, which is approximately 2.5 million US dollars, US dollars. Companies also have to file a master file and a local file if they have a total revenue or total assets of 50 million or above, which is equally to around 11, 12 million US dollars. And um, th I think that the special thing is that not, not only international transactions, also domestic transactions have to report it, which makes it a bit, um, you know, a bit tricky. With respect to the deadlines you mentioned already, June will be very important for us. So there are basically there are three different deadlines. Uh, TP declaration follows the tax filing deadlines, which this year have been spreaded uh, between April for all and gas enti entities, uh, 30th of June for all um, taxable entities, which means, you know, partly foreign owned entities and uh, end of August for all exempt entities. Uh, the deadline for local file and master file seems to be end of June. However, uh, we hope that uh, we will get the message soon from the tax authorities that this will be extended until end of September. Uh, Stuart here. Shavana, there's, yeah. a, there's a couple of questions that have come in and they're, they're sort of reasonably linked before we get to South Asia. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just uh, read these out and, 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 and maybe you and the team can. So the first one is talking about under which jurisdictions the global minimum tax would be applicable. Um, and then the following question is obviously how would UAE and Bahrain respond to that? And then on the same theme is um, the 15% minimum tax is this just for large corporations or will it be applicable you know and, and what's our thinking around timing um, of applicability in the gcc and also around free trade zones so sort of all sort of linked i think the first two are sort of together and obviously the third one is a little bit more a little bit more difficult given you haven't actually seen the details yet but um mm -hmm. i just want to see if you and the team want to want to pick up on the on those before we yeah, move to South Asia. Sure. 
Sure, Stuart. And maybe maybe I'll I'll address those in in a few parts, and then obviously the team can contribute as well. So I think in terms of the first part, um, so the it will be adopted by in all jurisdictions that are clearly in the G7, which is what the commitment was made over the weekend. We expect that to be extended to the G20 once the meeting in Venice is concluded in July, and then of course the expectation is that the all the OECD members. And this is the big one, whether the all inclusive framework members also adopt these regulations. And I think given what is being proposed, so effectively a global minimum tax, if this was anything else, I, I would think that the inclusive framework members would have time to delay adopting these provisions. But because it's the global minimum tax, essentially the longer they don't adopt it, the more they have a risk of losing out. So I think the really the pressure is on um, and we'll my my view on this personal view is that it will become adopted by the majority of jurisdictions given what's at stake um and then i think in terms of the other questions so maybe i'll just address the uae and Bahrain point um again um, Shavani, when, that, when you when, when you when you say at stake you, you you're basically saying is if they don't if those jurisdictions don't tax then someone else will tax on their behalf exactly. and therefore you, there's lost revenue Exactly, Stuart. So I think the point here is that, you know, if you look at the basis of the rules, it's really targeting those jurisdictions that are failing to exercise their primary right to tax. And so if I look at UAE or Bahrain, there are clearly examples of jurisdictions that are currently not, in the majority of cases, they're not exercising their right to primary right to tax. And therefore, you know, that tax revenue is essentially at risk of being lost to another jurisdiction, which I don't think any Ministry of Finance would, you know, would welcome wherever they are in the world. So I think that that really explains the pressure. Um, and that will certainly then, you know, pave the, the way forward in terms of any changes we see on a, on a regional or domestic level. I think actually I, I can only add to this. I think in, in Qatar, the discussions have actually already started, you know, whether, you know, what could be the possibility, whether increasing tax rates or, or changing the rules again. So exactly for this reason. So why should you give the tax revenue to somebody else if the companies have to pay it anyhow at the end? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point. Maybe just just to add from from the Saudi perspective, because I think there are there are two effects that, that we need to consider on the one side. Obviously, since Saudi is a member of the G20, so, so they will probably have to act more quickly than, than, than maybe other countries. Secondly, they already have a corporate tax, which is 20%, so it would be above the threshold. But as you all know, we also have the Zakat regime, which taxes on a different uh, basis at 2% level. So, so the question will be, and, and uh, that's probably the next big step that we need to anticipate is, Will Zakat stay there or will there be a move into some kind of a corporate tax for all the companies in, in the kingdom and Zakat may become a secondary tax con compared to the corporate income tax? So, so that's something that in any case was a discussion point, I would say, within, within the Ministry of Finance here. And I think the recent developments now have, have increased the pressure to take a decision to, towards the, the future of the tax system, if you want, here in the kingdom. Yeah, and, and Stefan, I couldn't agree more, it's particularly in relation to Saudi Arabia, given that when they were the chair of the G20, they specifically argued for and successfully managed to have Zagat included as a cover tax for pillar two purposes. So clearly their commitment, you know, it, it's it's indirectly already signaled, I feel, in the blueprint. Um, but yes, fully agree. Sharmila, in terms of the South Asia perspective, is there anything you'd want to add? I think uh, sorry Shamana, you're breaking up. Are you able to hear me? Audible? Yes, I can now. Okay, yeah. Uh, so if I just give you a brief overview of what we have in Sri Lanka on transfer pricing. We've had transfer pricing for a while. Uh, we introduced transfer pricing into tax law in 2012, uh, initially covering international transactions, then expanded to domestic transactions. And uh, we have 
uh, currently companies need to maintain the local file and also make a disclosure to the tax authorities which goes with the annual return. So the tax authorities in Sanka have gone through a few audits. They have gone through a few audit cycles, and I think the emphasis been on reviewing the adequacy of profits in the local entity. And this testing uh, has been done largely from the local entity perspective. Now, in last year, there was a regulation that was issued by which, like in many other countries, uh, the maintenance of the master file and the filing of the C by C is to be made mandatory. So from the year of assessment 2021, that is from April 20 to March 21, covering that year, the master file needs to be maintained and filed within a year. So from a Sri Lanka or a South Asian perspective, I think the emphasis is going to shift from the revenue authorities looking at operating companies to finding or seeing the global picture and understanding the profitability of the groups and its capacities. And from that, I would think that there would also be a review of characterization entities. Currently, it was you know, mostly risk-bearing entities, but probably a characterization of entities and the testing to see the adequacy of profits that are booked here. Thank you, Shamana. And it's interesting you say the recharacterization of entities because I think, you know, as soon as that those words are uttered by a tax authority, it usually usually involves a very long and lengthy discussion or audit. Um, so, are you seeing a number of audits in Sri Lanka, or are they generally, you know, generally quiet? How how is the environment looking from an audit perspective? Um, the audits here are predominantly looking at the international transaction and this started with losses. So, going to aggressive audits have been tested from the local entity perspective, and with uh, a wide range, we have from 0.25 to 0.75 range. Uh, most of them satisfy the arm's length test. Uh, but the issue is going to be when the master file is filed or the C by C, I'm sure the revenue authorities are now going to look at the finer points of transfer pricing and insist that testing may not be required from the Sri Lanka perspective, but probably from the other entity. And we have substantial transactions with procurement centers. The analysis and a review of the value chain. Sure. Well, thank you, Sean. Well, that was really helpful. And Stefan, maybe if I bring you in here, because I know it's not just obviously Sri Lanka or Egypt that face um, that clients face a number of transfer pricing challenges. I think one hot area or hot jurisdiction continues to be Saudi Arabia. So, in terms of you know high risk transactions, could you just give us a summary of? What you see in in Saudi in particular? No, no. Thanks, and, Steph, and Stefan, and Stefan, and yes. Stefan, there's also a question for you for Saudi as well. Um, that's coming around. Um, if an entity has transactions with a related party that does not meet the threshold of uh, SAR six million, still required to maintain local and master file and disclosure requirements. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah that, that's a good question. Let, let me take that first because that, that's. Uh, um, that's that's uh, quick to answer. So, um, so if if the entity does not meet the, the six million threshold, the six million threshold is important. It's for the related party revenue. So it's different than the regulations or the threshold in Qatar. So here we're only talking about the related party transactions. If they don't exceed the six million SAR, then there's no need to maintain a low, local file or a master file. But you would still need to be required to file the disclosure form as part of the tax return. So for the disclosure form, there there's no minimum threshold. So as soon as you have related party transaction, they have to be disclosed in the in the tax return. So so I think that's that's important to understand about the the obligations towards this in, in Saudi. And then the second question from from Shavana in terms of um, 
the recent developments and the high risk uh, transactions, I, I think we can clearly de uh, decipher a pattern now that, uh, that the authorities are applying. So I would say if you are part of a CBC group that already increases the risk of being picked up for an audit, and we've seen a couple of them by now, then if you are a branch of a foreign entity that also increases the risk of being picked up, of course, if you're a loss-making entity, that's that's another uh, red flag that, that we see a couple of times. And I would say if you are dealing with the UEE, also there are some some cases where, where this is has been picked up because they want to clearly understand what is the nature of the transaction, is there any potential of profit shifting happening? So and, and I think this has become recently um, in connection with the WTEX treaty between Saudi and, and the UE, because now there, there is a bit of, of movement from, from that side. So there is a clear view of the local tax authorities here to understand what are these business ties that they have with the UE. So that I would say in a nutshell are, are the risky uh, transactions, or at least the ones that would clearly um, increase the risk of being picked up for an audit. Thank you, Stefan. And clearly, there's you know there's, there's very common themes here around for groups in the region dealing with the not just the international changes, but clearly lots of regional changes as well, and lots of changes or, or maybe appetite for tax authorities to really challenge pricing and, and transfer pricing generally across the groups, whether you are a part of a large group, Stefan, or a branch, um, or dealing with the UAE. I know that's a common issue from a UAE Oman perspective as well. There's a lot of transactions that get picked up by the Oman tax authorities just because they are with the UAE subsidiary or, or parent. Um, you know, given we've spoken about a lot of these topics now, um, in terms of, you know, if you were sitting in a client's shoes listening to this, um, you know, what would you say if the question was, well, you know, what, what should I expect from my effective tax rate going forward, given all these developments? Um, and, you know, how, how best can I manage some of these, these changes? Yep, so so that, that's a good question. I think that's an extremely relevant question now nowadays uh, to, to start thinking about these, these um, issues in, in, in a broader sense. So first of all, I think what we need to what we need to acknowledge, and again, that's a, that's a theme that not only was a topic of, of our panel here, but also in the previous panels, it's, it's around um, data and tax data and the information that we need to prepare. Because yes, we're talking about all these increased requirements in terms of reporting. So we talked about disclosure forms, we talked about documentation, we talked about country by country reporting. So all this document is all these documents, all this information lands not only in the hand of my local tech authorities, no, this information goes out to the wider public. So I, I don't want to discuss here now the, the EU's su suggestion of doing a, a public CBCR because I think what we have already is a lot of exchanging of information between the tech authorities. So what we can see clearly and what will become even more evident in the future is that tax authorities are exchanging information and they have a lot of information available to them. This means that in an audit situation, they will ask a lot of more detailed questions. They're asking for a lot of more details because they know that the client have this information that gives them a better view on how to assess a specific a specific. Um, uh, subsidiary, let's say, a, a specific local uh, local entity, let's say, for instance, in Saudi. And of course, now from a client perspective, it's, I think, important to understand or to analyze, okay, so what is my current setup in terms of transfer pricing? What are the information that I'm putting out? Are these, are these stories making a story or am I inconsistent in some of my stories that I'm, I'm telling to different tech authorities? Because that's something that obviously does not work. So I have to be consistent, and this means that I need to do an analysis to see what are my local, what are my transactions, my lead party transactions. Do they still make sense? Do I need to reevaluate these transactions? And how can I make sure that I'm I'm applying the most efficient transfer pricing system going forward? I think that's that's the in a nutshell the most the most relevant question uh, that everybody should ask themselves now. Okay. Thank you, Stefan. And I believe we have a couple of other questions in the chat. Yeah, so so Megan, there's a couple for, for Egypt, one one quite specific, um, and then one more broader. The specific one is will there be any postponement 
of local file submission dates by the Egyptian tax authorities. Um, and the second one is back to the minimum global tax rate. And in Egypt, you've got free trade zones and how that, that will interplay. And I suppose then Shabana, you know, there's free trade zones across the region. So you might also want to want to sort of have a have a view on that as well. Yeah, Stuart, uh, would you please uh, repeat the questions again, please? Yeah, so the, yeah, so the first one I was will be will there be any postponement of local file submission dates to the Egyptian tax authority? Mm -hmm. uh, it was indicated under the law that uh, you have to file the uh, local file within two months following the date of filing the tax return. However, uh, in case uh, you will file an extension for the income tax return. Uh, normally for 60 days, it means that you have another 60 days to uh, file the local file. Okay. And the second question was to Egypt, but actually applies across the region, um, you know, with the minimum global rate of tax and a lot of countries in the region, such as Egypt, such as UAE, Saudi and others as well, and apologies if I, if I, if I miss one out, have free trade zones or, or, or tax holidays. And there's been a couple of questions come in on the chat and also uh, privately. How do we have any view on how the interplay between that global minimum rate of tax and tax incentives or free trade zones will play out? And I understand we don't have a lot of details, but there's, there's been about four questions come in around that, um, Shabana and team. Yeah, so maybe maybe I can tackle this one first. Um, so from a UAE perspective, absolutely, we have I think close to twenty five free trade zones in Dubai at least, in the Emirate of Dubai. So clearly, lots and 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 you know, unlike uh, many other jurisdictions, for example, um, the newly formed free zone in KSA, a lot of these are not um, fenced or or have border controls around them. So I think they're quite. You know, they were clearly set up with a, a very clear purpose to encourage foreign direct investment. Um, and they were given a number of promises once they were set up, which were, you know, one of which was um, a tax holiday, a corporate tax holiday. But we saw when VAT was introduced in the UAE that VAT applied to mainland and free trade zone companies. So clearly there's one option, which is the regulations of, you know, minimum global tax would apply equally to those um, free trade zones. Or they could be treated slightly differently, for example, and be, um, you know, be continue to have some sort of exemption or relief. Um, but I think the form in which that relief will be given may be different to what it is today. And you know, we heard at the beginning, I think, of the first panel. I think it was Chris who mentioned the fact, or, or David that mentioned. It might not be a low tax rate or a zero tax rate. It might be a grant or another commercial kind of advantage that's given to these companies instead to, again, meet those original objectives of encouraging investment or being a competitive place to do business. So I think those, you know, the, the rationale for having these companies or having these incentives hasn't changed. So we just might see either these tax rules apply to them directly or the manner in which that they apply or take a different um, form. Uh, I, I, I have, have uh, yeah, this is, um, you know, something I have to add, uh, of course, under the, the very recent changes within the last two days where uh, the guidance was issued by the government and they have indicated actually that uh, you know, uh, if you are a free zone company, you are required to file the transfer pricing documentation. So it is not clear uh, the mechanism, especially that, uh, you know, the free zone companies are not subject to income tax by law. So uh, how to manage this in practice, this is not clear. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Shabana. Thanks, Megan. I think. Um... I think, Shana, we're, we're coming to the end of the session. Um, it's been great. Um, I always tell any new graduate who comes into tax, uh, the one service line that you should consider for your future of your career is transfer pricing. It seems to be taken over everything else. Um, bit, a bit late for me, obviously, but um, <laughs> um, but uh, it's certainly uh, it's certainly dominating everything at the moment. So we might just we might just pause there. Thanks, uh, Shabana and panel. Um, 
uh, we're going to move on to our, our third and final panel, and we're in our sort of final hour. This is a little bit shorter, um, so we, you know, uh, and we're going to we're going to bring Zabir Patel in, and Zabir um, is the head of tax in Kuwait. He has got a similar panel. We're going to talk a little bit around some more transformation issues that um, that Chris and Howard spoke about in panel one, and. Um, Sorry, my video is not working. Let me just. Not sure if my video is working. Many apologies. Um, hopefully, you can still hear me. Um, ping me if you yes, can. Yes, Stuart, we can. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, my video is popping in and out. Uh, I live. Um, sorry, I'm. I'm doing this from Australia, and um, it's a third world country when it comes to internet connection. Um, so. Sabera and he's kind of going to talk about tax transformation and, and everything digital and data. And so, Sabera, I'll pass it to you to introduce the panel, uh, and we're looking forward to, to the next 40 minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart, and uh, welcome again, everybody, uh, to the Mesa Tax Conference. Uh, we're obviously going to talk about, as you probably saw on the agenda, the transformation aspect. And uh, I think carrying on what was being said in the conference until now, we're going to look at the tax function of the future. And obviously talk about the digitization, i.e. the automation aspects, and obviously talk about the resource they required now, uh, considering the amount of changes uh, that have taken place. So before I obviously just uh, introduce the panel, I think let's just quickly recap what's happened up till now. Um, so obviously we have been hearing about changes to the overall tax outlook. Uh, VAT, I heard, um, I think Stuart and the panelists, you know, talk about changes to coming to customs, ESG, uh, mobility implications with respect to PE aspects. On the second session, we talked about, you know, we saw the drive for transparency that's sort of happening globally, not only globally, but regionally as well, as covered by Shabana and the, the panelists. So I think we'll all agree at this stage, you know, with the, 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 the substantial changes that have been taking place, uh, not only globally, but in our region as well. And, and with the tax authorities ramping up, the digital transformation, the level of the tax risk has definitely arisen. And I think David did allude to that in his um, initial discussion. And, and I think that is really underlined by the KPMG's global CEO survey, which rated tax as the second highest uh, risk after the cybersecurity. I think so. The stakes have never been higher. And I think so. I think we, I'm going to now introduce our panelists um, uh, to sort of talk about the tax function of the future and to see, you know, how uh, how the automate automation and the digitization would assist of dealing with the changing landscape. So I have with me uh, Rahul Dinodia. He is the tax lead um, in the Alshaya Group. So and along with him is Muhammad Araji. He is a senior tax director. He also leads the tax transformation aspects in KPMG Saudi Arabia. I've got Mubin Khadir who's the head of tax at KPMG in Bahrain. And of course, from our global team, we've got Amar Thakrar, who is a tax compliance and transformation partner in KPMG UK. And on the technology and the transformation side from KPMG Netherlands, we've got Alexander Ziegers. So welcome everybody, hope you're all well. Um, and uh, yeah, just like me, I think you might be, uh, you know, the, the kind of changes we've been hearing about, I think the, the changes that have taken place since 2019, particularly, I think it's probably the 10, worth, 10 years worth of changes uh, beforehand. So I think with that in mind, let's, let's, you know, discuss together what a tax department in the future in an organization should look like. So I think I'm going to start with you, Amara. I think somebody who's actually worked uh, in the industry and obviously now with KPMG uh, and assisting companies, uh, major multinationals uh, with the tax transformation project in the light of what's happening uh, globally within the tax. So, I mean, uh, what do you see, I think, the, the organization? How are they reacting to this sort of the, the massive changes that are taking place in the tax landscape and the level of the tax risk actually that's really increasing? So how are they trying to manage that? So, Bear, so I think if I go back three years, I think every time a new tax requirement in the technology or digital space came out, it was very piecemeal and solution by solution. 
now tax functions are actually stepping back more broadly and say actually looking further afield, just just not just in the headquarter country, but every country that they operate in, they're looking to actually create more of a strategy around the digital tax and real time reporting requirements. So, so along with that strategy, some key pillars seem to be that they want their tax function to be very forward looking rather than backwards looking to come out of the historical data and out of compliance and actually an enterprise is fixing them for the future, making sure the same issues don't keep going into daily requirements and into daily reporting that's going to the tax authorities, but also being more business partnering. And I think the other piece I'm seeing is actually a focus on strategic, focus on strategic partnerships. They're working with either big four providers or specific technology companies to leverage the technology that's already out there rather than building it from scratch because the requirements are changing so fast the only way you can keep up is by working and partnering with other people. Yes, quite a lot of change in the uh, is what you're highlighting. Yeah. I think it's, it's probably a good time to bring Rahul in. I mean, Rahul, obviously, uh, I would say you're still on the client side and uh, probably good, you know, as one of the tech leads in one of the biggest retail groups in the region uh, at Al Shire. I mean, what are you seeing from a client perspective, you know, uh, from respecting sitting in a corporate like that, you know, with with the tax risk increasing? I mean, how do you take comfort on your tax positions? I think it'll be good to hear from you, Rahul, on that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Zubair. Uh, this era, I would say, would be termed as the era of tax revolution. We have seen a lot of revolutions in the past, but Nothing of this magnitude has ever happened in the taxation field. GCC region is slowly moving from a no tax regime to a low tax regime. And the way things are happening, it's difficult at times for the businesses or the industry to match pace with it. So many changes have happened in just last one or two years. It's hard to believe that uh, you know, it, it happened in GCC, which used to be considered a safe tax heaven or a, a low tax or a no tax jurisdiction. If, if I just name a few, excise VAT, UBO disclosures, ESR disclosures, CBCR implementation, transfer pricing implementation. So it's, it's challenging. The tax authorities in the region are learning. And I would say the tax in GCC is maturing. And it brings with it a new set of challenges which the businesses need to cope up with. And uh, yeah, as, as the panelists have earlier said, uh, it's it's high time that we all need to, you know, look at how how do we uh, match pace with these challenges and how do we bring our tax functions or uh, our, our tax departments uh, up to the mark. And you know, we don't want to fall behind in terms of compliances or in terms of uh, other mandatory disclosures or reporting for, for that matter. I mean, do you see there is a gap, Rahul? I mean, in the, I mean, where we are in the region, particularly in the way the tax authorities are moving, you, you see a gap in that? Well, I, I do feel there is, there is a mismatch, Zubair, uh, when, when we compare the tax authorities with the, with the industry. The tax authority is is moving ahead at a great pace. If if I would say the way uh, the tax authorities are modernizing themselves, uh, it's not the same way the businesses are modernizing themselves. The businesses have a fixed way of operating and uh, they continue doing that until unless there is a mandatory requirement or if there is a bottleneck which does not let them produce the results the way they, they want to or the way it should be. So yes, there is definitely a gap uh, the economic challenges in the financial crisis has left the tax authorities with no other choice, no other option other than to, you know, pull up their socks and get up to speed. Nearly all the jurisdictions in the GCC, they are OECD inclusive framework members, and uh, they all are falling in line with the OECD initiatives, be it implementing uh, CBCR, transfer pricing. And I wouldn't be surprised if the G7 initiative, which happened over the weekend, if that the ripple effect is experienced in the GCC and the GCC also implements a 15% mandatory corporate income tax. 
Now for our family businesses or for the GCC businesses, that would be significant. So yes, indeed, there is, there is a gap that exists. Yeah. So there is a shareholder impact, of course. And I think talking yeah. about transparency, I think thought uh, to get uh, our uh, partner in Saudi Arabia, Mohammed Araji on the, on the line. So Mohammed, I know there is Saudis bringing in substantial changes in the e-invoicing space, et cetera. So good to hear from you. I think GCC, you know, Saudi being one of the, obviously the biggest market within the GCC. So good to know how the transformation aspects are moving on in that territory. Thanks Zubair and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, no doubt uh, Zubair, uh, e-invoicing is everybody's discussion these days. Uh, I mean, a lot of the businesses were going through transformation post COVID by by circumstances that happened around them access to data ability to remotely extract data and and submit reports and then e-invoicing was introduced so this time disruption major disruption to businesses is happening by regulation and with a very short and tight deadline so businesses in saudi they should uh, do a lot of the e-invoicing requirements as as in generating and storing uh electronic invoices by december 4th of this year so that's few months ago uh, sorry a few months away and final regulations were issued last week so it, there's a lot of issue and there's a lot of uh hunger by tax authorities to collect data uh all what they're looking for if we look at all the panels that we've heard and what my colleagues on this panel mentioned the governments are after data they want to know their information real time they don't want to wait for reports that you submit and they might or might not audit you in the next two or three years to know what's in that summary report. They're after real time information and potentially, for example, in Saudi reaching a point where they will know your return before you submit it. You merely have to accept it and make a payment if, if you owe. So there's a lot of pressure on businesses to catch up. And as Rahul mentioned, uh, tax authorities are being very aggressive on the technology investment forefront and Saudi is a real uh, example of that. Uh, the tax authority and by the way, the name changed from Gazette to Zatka uh, recently because they combined the customs and the, and the tax uh, into one authority are at the forefront of investing in technology and getting information uh, at very in a very short time frame. So audits used to give you a week or 10 days or two weeks to get your information. Now we see from our clients, we want to know about these transactions and can you give them tomorrow afternoon before close of business or within 48 hours? So definitely there's a lot of transformational trend that's impacting tax functions and finance functions in Saudi and e invoicing just added a big uh, swirl to, 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 to all this uh, thinking. So uh, uh, challenging times are, are coming up. Yeah. And I think obviously a um, good time to get Mubin in. Uh, Mubin, obviously this requires investment and particularly in this region, the challenge has been is that whether the companies are willing to invest in this sort of transformation. So what's the trend you're seeing in Bahrain, for example, you know, where you're heading the tax function, speaking to your clients? Yeah. Thanks, Zubair. The, the, look, the region is very interesting. Uh, I think the region is always seen, especially the GCC region, is seen as a block. However, if you look at the different uh, tax regimes around the region, they're all very different. I mean, uh, Saudi has a very advanced corporate tax system and has a card system. Oman has a corporate tax system. And, you know, Qatar and Kuwait are similar with, with corporate tax, at least on foreign companies. Uh, whereas UAE and Bahrain uh, are a bit further behind from a corporate tax perspective. But then you look at how businesses operate as well. So you've got you know, varying sizes of businesses. Uh, Saudi businesses are used to corporate tax. You've got a lot of the multinationals headquartered in, in the UAE. And we, we found this with uh, VX implementation a few years ago. So the businesses were in different places. The, the technologies that they had in, in, in within the organization was uh, some organization was very good, the others was very bad. So in terms of is the business case there for tra tax transformation, it's there because I think, uh, especially now with the G7 uh, voting on uh, you know, a global minimum tax, uh, the other countries within the region looking at corporate tax system, uh, I think really what businesses need to do is get ready for uh, basically, you know, tax authorities coming, knocking on your door, 
um, and get the technology in there and, and be ready for, for tax, um, you know, more, more prevalence of tax uh, and, and a broader uh, system of tax coming in. So I think um, businesses in Bahrain uh, will be f further behind compared to other businesses, UAE perhaps and Saudi perhaps a bit ahead of the game. Um, so we'll, it'll be interesting to watch, especially because the region is really uh, seen as one and a lot of businesses operate across the region. Even the multinationals that come in here pro pro uh, operate across the region. So it's really interesting time. But the, the business case is ready and it's, you know, businesses should really start uh, thinking about technology and how technology can help them, um, you know, cater for tax. Well, I think it's an opportune uh, moment to bring in um, Alex, who is obviously uh, a text technology lead at uh, KPMG Netherlands. So I think we, Alex, you probably saw the panelists talk about the quick turnaround times in terms of text audits. Uh, talking about, you know, data analytics and the, the need for data. So I think with somebody, I think that's, you know, the core part of your work. I mean, what sort of digital transfers disruptions are you seeing in this space, particularly with the, the kind of dynamic changes coming in the last couple of years? Yeah, thanks, Subhar. Um, as already uh, mentioned, there's a sort of revolution happening now in, in the digital reporting space. Mohamed also referred to this, which of course puts a lot of pressure on on taxpayers and organizations to uh, get information um, available and in a lot, a lot richer format. This is also greatly summarized in the recent publication um, by the OECD in December on um, Tax Authorities 3.0, where we see um, some best practices from um, more sophisticated tax authorities in the world how they organized um, their tax um, collection process. And this, of course, puts a lot of pressure on organizations to implement what they refer to systems like a compliance by design principle, which means um, so proof that the systems and the processes that are in place in the organization produce good quality data at first, at first time, right? Because that is required if you need to report uh, very quickly after the fact. And you can imagine that uh, those type of principles and requirements would put a lot of pressure on systems, right? Um, there's a big data challenge with this. So uh, do you really trust in the data that comes from, from, the, from the processes and systems in your organization? And how do you go about changing that, right? Because most of the organizations in, in, in this region have systems in place already for many years. Right? If not, they're not implemented a year ago, maybe already 10 years ago. And, with tax authorities asking more, um, more, more, more real-time type of information, it's very hard to just uh, change the system which was which was um, based implemented on different principles. So that um, requires organizations to take a look at um, third-party bolt-ons to systems, or if if you have an opportunity in your in your organization to step on a digital revolution like a, a transformation to a new ERP system because. Um, as an upgrade already, I think it's a tremendous chance now to, to take into account this new situation. Um, so in my view, yeah, it's, it's, it's very exciting on the other hand also to work in tech now, specifically in technology, because um, yeah, if there's a time where, where uh, tech teams need technology, it's, it's now. And it's, it, it's, it has changed significantly since, since the past two years, uh, not just in this region, but, but globally. So it's, it's a very exciting times to, I think, to, uh, uh, to work in this space. I think good to hear now. I think the tech professionals are becoming exciting, isn't it? Uh, thanks to technology, of course. Well, I think getting to Rahul, uh, uh, from your side, I mean, I've seen, as, as Mubin highlighted, you know, we've got sets of organizations in this region which are, you know, getting automated, but obviously quite a lot of the work is still manual. I mean, what are your thoughts, Rahul? Obviously, do you think, I mean, uh, and I think we've had a chat about this, you know, earlier as well uh, when we met. And maybe just for our uh, audience, it would be good to hear from you. I think there's quite a lot of, you know, manual sort of systems still in this region. Uh, where do you think we are going with that, particularly with the kind of transparency and the data analytics that will be required, particularly the data analysis that is being required by the ministries? Yeah, thanks, Zubair. Uh, firstly, I would like to share some facts that I have recently come across. There was a survey done, I guess, a year or two back, 
And uh, the outcome was that more than 50% of the organizations in the region, they're not very comfortable about the uh, quality of the data when it comes to tax inspection. And uh, as per the survey, only 10% of the organizations were really prepared for any uh, uh, you know, tax scrutiny that comes all of a sudden. So that raises serious red flags. Uh, the tax authorities are modernizing themselves and uh, it's happening at great pace. But the industries and the businesses in the region, they are still uh, relying on the old fashioned way or the existing methods of doing things. Now, that poses a lot of challenges. As uh, Mohammed also mentioned, and the earlier panelists have mentioned, when you get a query, for example, from Saudi tax authorities or Qatar tax authorities, um, you take some time to prepare the data because you're still relying on the manual way of preparing those. And when you submit the data, they come back in really short time, in a day or two probably, or less than a week, asking you further questions which you are unprepared about. And then you don't know what to do because it already took a lot of efforts and resources on your part to prepare that part of data. So I read this quote somewhere that you cannot uh, enter into a F1 race with a bicycle. So the tax authorities are, I think, riding uh, you know, the highly automated cars. So the tax, uh, the businesses also need to uh, match the speed if, if they want to be in full compliance and if they do not want to have any unwanted tax liabilities or any, any unfavorable situation, which uh, nobody would like to have on them. So yeah, the businesses in the region, they, I believe, need to update themselves and need to start thinking about how to modernize and digitize the way they have been doing things so that if there is any query or if one fine day they need to know what's happening in the region, at least they can get it through this without spending enormous efforts manually. Well, thanks, Rahul, and I love uh, your example. Sorry, about... sorry Zubair, just to, just to uh, interrupt, sorry to interrupt, but there's, there's a question that's come up which will probably be interesting to answer. Uh, when would you expect real-time reporting to be implemented is a question that's been posed. So I, I don't know, maybe, maybe Mohammed could sort of, sort of, especially given the invoicing coming into Saudi, perhaps he could uh, start off answering that question. Uh, yeah, so the time frame for uh, the e-invoicing is, is in two phases. The first phase starting uh, commencing on uh, December 4th, where uh, businesses will generate and, and store the, the, the e-invoices uh, in XML format and they have references. But in beginning 2023, these invoices will be shared with the government real time, getting approved through a huge platform that's being built as we understand. And that's where uh, uh, the tax authority will know real time every transaction that's every invoice actually that's being issued, of course, for businesses that are VAT registered. So looking on the time frame and Beginning 2023, you hear the number 2023, you think, oh, it's in two years. Basically, it's in a year and a half because it's end of 2022. Uh, so not much time is given to businesses, and that's phase two that, that kicks off uh, on that time. So uh, real time is around the corner. Uh, businesses who are working on e-invoicing are keeping that in mind. Yes, they, everybody is running and, and struggling to get to... Uh, completion of phase one by December 4th, but everybody's eye is on phase two that they need to be ready for uh, very soon. Yeah. Well, thanks, Mohammed. Then I think just picking up on Rahul's uh, point earlier, Amar, I know the whole issue about return on investment, and I think the issue is that, uh, you know, the tax guys are saying, look, I think as, as Harvard Health picked up, you know, we there's a lot to do, and how do you justify that within an organization and particularly somebody who's worked within gsk before and obviously dealing with the bigger corporates i mean how do you think this debate is sort of taking place uh, within the corporates and and the challenge is and i think i think we've heard it already that there's so many different approaches you have to spend a lot of money in a lot of different places to meet, meet the requirements so so a common approach is increasingly important i think rahul called it out spot on when 
he 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 used the analogy that you can't have an you know you need an F1 car. <laughs> so so actually, how do you how do you go about doing that? And I think kind of as we're talking about the, the shortened timelines, the increased scrutiny of data, we, we're all coming back to this point that the battle will be won and lost around data quality because actually, if you need to take your data and do less to it for a process, you have more confidence in giving that data to a tax authority. And I, you know, I, I was in house previously. I worked with a lot of large businesses in Europe, Middle East, and Africa today. And um, a number of those, number of those organisations have a lot of weak process and controls. That has happened over time, especially in the indirect tax space. And and often actually, rather than that creating risk, it means that taxes are knowingly overpaid. So, for example, I've 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 got a number of clients. Um, I'll mention, I'll kind of bring an example of one in particular who. Um, have either been, you know, I've got a number of clients who invested in a leveraged model using outsourcers or have invested in their own technology of their systems to improve systems and processes. Now, they have spent a lot, but what has come through is that they've also saved a lot. So, coming back to your points about the business case, thinking about the example I had in mind was that there was a client who asked um, KPMG to perform a health check, and through a very small project with a very small fee, we found that the that the client had been paying and overpaying indirect tax for a number of years. So we looked at the business case, and for the client to radically change their systems, back to Alexander's point, it's not easy. This cost in the region of one million euros, but actually the amount of indirect tax that they've saved by actually having better systems in place was one point five million euros a year. So the payback was actually less than one year, and then there was a, an ongoing annuity. So. There was a very clear business case with this client, and I think as organisations make small investments in understanding where their data and processes lie, they'll perhaps find similar opportunities to show that there is a business case commercially, not just reputationally. Yeah, I think reputation is is a key key point, and I think particularly even um, the corporates that I'm talking to these days in in the region are, you know. Are a bit concerned about sharing of data, and I think Mubin, you know, when we talk about sharing of data, I know I think data quality and availability remains a remains a key issue. So I think. Sabir, so Stuart, so here. Yeah. Just a question has come in, which I think is relevant for the conversation. There's a, a question coming about real time data, uh, real time reporting, and, and when it's likely to be implemented in the region. Well, we we just answered that question actually, Stuart. I think we 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 just talked about that before. Um, yeah. Another question on the same point, or no apologies. Yeah. No, no, I, I think that question was picked up by Mubin as well. So I think uh, Mohammed had responded to that one. Yeah. Um, yes. There one question about e invoicing and what needs to be done. I think uh, I'll just carve out 20 seconds to tell everybody on this call that we are preparing for a dedicated e-invoicing seminar or workshop like this in the next couple of weeks. Invitation will go out very shortly and that will explore a lot and in details on what's required in phase one, phase two, and how the whole picture will wrap up in the time constraints we have today. So these will be addressed in a similar uh, workshop shortly. Correct. And, and I think as you said earlier, 2023 is not, it's not that far away. Uh, you're very close to action there. Uh, so I think we've been just staying with that question on data quality, you know, which is again a whole discussion about uh, what are the challenges there that you're finding the clients have? And I think particularly in this region, you know, when we talk about the GCC region specifically. Yeah, look, I think uh, picking up on the point that Mohammed made, I mean, tax authorities are basically um, requesting data, you provide it, and they come back very quickly. Um, so I think the tax authorities are moving at a much faster pace than businesses are. And what we found, found in the region, and if again, if you go back to VAT implementation a few years ago, what we found was that the data quality is very, very poor generally in organizations. I mean, a lot of businesses are using multiple systems, they're using legacy systems. Um, they're working for, if so if there's a problem with the system, they fix it outside the system rather than actually fix the system itself. So the, the quality of data that you're getting um, is a huge problem in, in the region. And I think, look, there are probably organizations like a large organization 
um, you know, and Rahul can correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, organizations like Alshaya may be ahead of the game here, but the majority of organizations are, I think, uh, behind uh, at the moment. So with tax authorities moving at a much faster pace, I think what really needs to happen is businesses need to start thinking about um, how they can improve this because tax authorities will come and ask you for information. And if you can't at the time, you know, you may get assessments happening faster. You may get uh, arbitrary assessments because you're not able to provide the data or the quality of data is not good enough to justify your, your tax position or defend your tax position. So I think it's, it's, it's a big issue at the moment and I think it will continue to be so uh, in the next few years. So I think again, I mean, I would say when we have got in one of the booths that we have the digital gateway tool as well that KPMG is produced. So if you do get some time to do have a look at that, I think once we, we move from the digital debate, but I think staying with you moving on on the tax function of the future, obviously the, I think the people would, would, would be critical part of the tax functions of, of the future. And I think talking about the resources effectively that we would have in the future tax function. I mean, how do you find the tax functions? Are they are, are they well staffed in the region? And they might be well staffed. But do you think they uh, uh, they're able to face you know the challenges that uh, that are going to come with the tax risks rising globally and regionally? Yeah. So look, I mean, if I go back to when I first moved to the region, um, which was about twelve years ago in two thousand and eight. Um, you know, if you looked at the tax function, there wasn't really a tax function within organizations. I mean, you had a few heads of tax or a few tax managers sitting in Dubai, but generally in the region, you find found very uh, few tax managers, tax heads of tax, um, maybe the sovereign wealth funds and the larger businesses. But this has started to change. I mean, obviously, uh, organizations are starting to sort of see the need for a tax function. It's still, you know, very much behind uh, where you would see other more mature tax jurisdictions at. Um, Saudi, especially in the last few years, has probably started to see the importance of a tax function, uh, bringing in people. Um, Dubai, obviously, has been like that for a few years, and then, you know, other jurisdictions as well. And, you know, al Shai is a perfect example where they, where they have a dedicated tax function now as well. So I think um, there's going to be a strong growth for, for tax people in the region. And I think uh, you know, we did a lot of analysis when we did implementation uh, for VAT about what an organization needs from a tax function, uh, not just VAT, but also direct taxes. Um, still, you know, a lot of it is handled by finance people, um, generally in the region, but more and more you're finding pure tax professionals coming in, perhaps with a technology bent as well. I think you mentioned Saudi, so I just wanted to go to Mohammed, I think, particularly with the kind of changes or the automation and digitization that the Gazette has been sort of um, bringing about. When you're talking yeah. to your clients yeah. and obviously both within KPMG internally, any challenges in recruitment you're seeing? Uh, the yes, there, there are uh, challenges in, in recruitment and I'll get to that point in a second. I just want to borrow uh, Rahul's uh, Formula One uh, example and tell you uh, Zapka here is definitely a Formula One car and they have the right uh, driver in it, as many of you might be aware or not, that the head of uh, Zatka is an engineer, an individual who understands the value of data and the importance of data, all the tax regulations. There are loads of people within the tax authority to, to understand the regulations, but at the top of this uh, huge tax uh, uh, regulator, there, there, are, there is an engineer who understands the value of data, and this is reflecting on the behavior of, of Zapka and its requirements and how they request information from clients. That ripple effect is into uh, clients and groups that we talk to uh, that I'm getting these requests that are really a very short notice. I don't know how to deal with my data. And then part of the transformation is you need somebody who understands data and technology part of tax. And then all of a sudden clients technology and data within tax and how's that? And then, OK, this is what they do. And this is how this investment in this techno technology knowledge and data knowledge as a resource will help you avoid penalties, will help you uh, save uh, uh, time in responding to these audits and requirements. So uh, that created a demand 
there are a lot of technology businesses and technology companies going into the tax business because they see the opportunity and they're also hiring tax individuals. So that's creating a crunch in, in the resource and the right resources to be found on in a very short notice. Well, it's interesting that, you know, but do you see quite a lot of recruitment taking place? Because I know that back two years back when all of this was at the outset, and I remember talking to quite a lot of companies in Saudi and they will say, you know, we'll see what happens next. But are you seeing now the recruitment, particularly of tax professionals on the rise in the region uh, on technology front? Uh, yes, yeah. and we see a lot of technology people uh, being recruited into tax functions. And uh, one interesting observation is now every time you talk to the client about a transformation or a transformation topic, you see on the call their technology team attending because they uh, they uh, they know the value and they appreciate the value of technology in the next step and yes we are seeing definitely without any doubt technology skills being sought after and re in, uh, recruited within uh, uh, tax functions but there's a difficulty in finding those resources oh, no, great and, and i think it's not just about that we want the new resources. It's all about retraining the current resources. So I think, Alex, I mean, what you've been seeing in that particular sp space, you know, what are the corporates that you find? I mean, what are the steps they can do? I think particularly for our clients listening to this uh, discussion, what can they do really to upskill? And, you know, um, in terms of the tax transformation aspects. Yeah, it's a challenge, yes, as Mohammed already, already mentioned, um, with, with um, more and more capabilities being asked for in tech to manage um, the new data uh, ecosystem more, more accurately it is a huge challenge. And I think one of the main reasons is those technology specialists, those talents who are, you know, data gurus and, and they, they have a background in, in something which is uh, not, not traditional economics or business um, education. You know, they, they're not naturally looking at tax to help, right? So they are more interested initially to, to explore a career at, at tech companies such as Amazon or Google or the other big platform providers. It's a more attractive employer for, um, for those talents. So I think that it was a big um, um, challenge within tax to make sure and to outline what, what is the opportunity for technology specialists to make a career in tax technology and to help uh, the tax function uh, move forward. Well, myself, I, I'm, a, I'm a technology trained uh, professional, and I made the step uh, one year, one of year ago, to tax. Also, because if if you've been working in this space for, for a number of years and, and you operate from from a technology background, it's it's more easy to get in touch with with the market through it through a tax lens. I think similar applies for for, for technology specialists who are seeking seeking out a career in tax technology. But still, um, at the moment, um, where we see the biggest challenges is, is finding those people from university. And I think we have a big um, task to, to accomplish to actually put, put tax more in the spotlights as, as a function that, that is changing and is going through a disruption now. So, um, but I think we were, we're ready for it and it's possible. It's just a different mindset I think that we uh, need to explore. Yeah. So I know we are just obviously we've got four to five minutes to to close this off, but I think Amar a very important point that if obviously if you were to look at a tax function in the next two to three years, what would be the composition? Do you think more IT professionals than finance or more 50-50? So it'd be good to just get your insights on that. I, and, I, and I smile because it's a question that's been going around for for a little bit bit of time now, and I think kind of we're at this point where. Um, even if we're at 80% traditional te technical, 20% so-called technologists, that's a good place to be. I think the reality is there's a lot of organizations which are at 100 zero. And I think the discussion we've had today is the same discussion organizations are having internally. So I think in the next 12, 24 months, we'll move to 80, 20. But I think the leading organizations who understand the importance of data and technology already at 80, 20, and they'll be moving to 50, 50. Um, your question about technologists is is interesting uh, because I, I, I've also seen it doesn't have to be an out and out technology person. Now you do need them, but I've also seen the value in having 
other other individuals from finance functions come in. So people who understand the accounts payable processes, for example, and how the data is processed from invoices to systems. Because actually that, that is where the data is generated for tax. And that's where you have to be able to define a minimum quality of data for tax as well. So I think there is a role for technologists, but I think the generalist who understands finance processes and can work with functions outside of tax in your organization is also is also increased. If I kind of say generalist plus technologists, I think fast forward three or four years, they'll make fifty they'll make a fifty percent of the tax function. Well, thanks very much, uh, Amar. And I mean, I think thanks again. I think we really run out of time, but um, and before I head to Stuart, though, I think just to summarize our discussion. I mean, we've heard from all the we heard from the panelists uh, in terms, you know, what a tax function of the future looks like, and I think this is really evolving due to the again the tax authorities digitizing more quicker than the actual corporates could upgrade the tax compliance process. So I think as a Part of the action which I'm hearing from the panelists is I think that needs to be done uh, sooner rather than later. The growing use of the data analytics definitely by the tax authorities also posing questions of the current tax department structures in the region. And with the tax risk increasing and the processes changing, the tax function of the future will be pressed now to evolve. So I think that's, that's something that we're going to see. So Raul, I'm going to finish with you. Uh, obviously, somebody who's actually doing this day in day out with, with the, you know such a substantial worldwide group you know if there's one thing particularly on this subject that you know keeps you awake you know what would you say as a client well uh, zubair uh, that's a very interesting question uh, the thing which i would say keeps me awake at night uh, there are a couple of things one the first thing is the way the tax reforms are coming in the way the regulations are changing and the way tax authorities are bringing in more measures to close the loopholes so that gives a need to you know review the existing business models or the structurings which were in place for many many years now that's a mammoth task so that's something which keeps me awake the second thing that keeps me awake is the way the technology is advancing now you have to really be aware of the changes and you have to stay ahead of the game if you if you want to you know do justice to to your role and uh, that's something that always uh, keeps me away and uh, in increased and mandatory uh, compliance requirements and that are so stringent stringent that there is no scope for any any wrong filing or any any mistakes in in particular in saudi in uae where the penalties are so so strict and uh, it could range in a big, big number. So yeah, these are the few things that really keeps me awake at night and uh, gives hard time, not just to uh, you know me, but I believe all the businesses in the, in the region. Yeah, automation is the answer, Rahul, definitely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I think with that, I think we have just run out of time. I'm gonna thank again the panelists, you know, all of you joining in and giving us uh, very good sort of insights. Uh, so over to you, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sabir, and, and, and thanks, panel. Um, and appreciate we're coming up to the, 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 the final three hour mark. So I um, just want to thank everybody, um, the panelists and the audience for joining. Uh, I'm going to drop off at the end of this uh, one minute, um, but I'm just going to pass it over uh, to Dr. Rashid. Uh, to close the, uh, the, the the session, but I'm also um, going to bring in uh, to the discussion is Michael Plowgen, and Michael's a principal in the U.S. firm's Washington National Tax Practice. He's our global head of tax policy for asset management, and prior to that, he was actually a senior advisor on BEPS during the original BEPS project, um, and he's an attorney in the International Tax Council's office. Uh, at the US Treasury uh, prior to that. So I'm going to bring Michael in and um, ask Dr. Rashid uh, to discuss with Michael, you know, the future of tax, future of tax in this region and, and to close the session. But, um, and uh, look, thank you for all your attendance and uh, Dr. Rashid, if I can pass to you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you for your uh, moderation. It's been a great day, honestly. Uh, we tried to cover uh, many aspects and uh, Michael welcome to the closing uh, session really delighted you are joining us 
And uh, we have a couple of questions, Michael, and the, probably if we hear the during the opening remarks and the three sessions and specifically the, the last one, the transformation, tax transformation and tax revolution and uh, things changing very, very rapidly. So uh, we've been hearing about the pets too and understand that this is divided two pillars. Uh, one focusing on the digital economy and the other focusing on the uh, global minimum rate tax. Can we explain what the proposal are in simple term and uh, how this will affect us, please? Thanks, Dr. Rashid. Um, happy to do that. Um, and, and as you say, we've, we've heard a little bit about BEPS 2.0 during the course of the conference. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about both the what and the why of, of BEPS 2.0. Um, and, and BEPS 2.0 is um, really driven by the sense that the current rules of the international tax regime are not working for countries. Um, and, and so these pillars really represent significant departures uh, from the existing international tax regime. And pillar one is really driven by a political sense that market countries, the, the countries where uh, people consume goods or services, um, are not getting a sufficient share of the tax pot. But there's disagreement among countries as to how widely that applies. Um, for, for some countries, as you say, it's just the digital economy. It's just uh, big tech companies, right? Um, for others, though, they think that it's it's really basically all multinationals um, where, where this is a problem. Um, and what's, what's currently on the table uh, is an attempt to compromise among those different positions. Um, and it's, it's based on the U.S. proposal, and it would give market jurisdictions a larger share of multinationals profits, but only for about the 100 largest uh, and most profitable uh, multinationals. Um, and we saw that actually, um, I think we, we referenced this earlier in the conference, uh, agreed uh, at the G7 uh, over the weekend um, that uh, it would be limited to the, the largest and, and most profitable multinational groups. Uh, and the idea is to capture the, the biggest digital companies, the biggest tech companies, but also other large uh, companies uh, that have benefited the most from globalization um, and allocate some of their profits to market jurisdictions based on a formula instead of on the arm's length principle. So again, a very, a very significant departure from the uh, existing international tax landscape. Pillar two, on the other hand, is, is about addressing base erosion uh, and profit shifting and trying to address the, the underlying incentives really uh, for base erosion. Some people uh, reference it as, as trying to stop the race to the bottom. Um, and the idea is that multinationals base erode uh, because they gain an advantage um, by shifting profits to a lower tax jurisdiction. And Pillar 2 says that that's fine. Um, countries can have whatever tax rate they want, um, but, but there are competing claims of taxing jurisdiction on cross-border income. And in the past, the international tax um, system divided up taxing rights and said, you know, source countries can tax this set of income and residence countries can, can tax that set of income. And each one's gonna give up their secondary rights um, on the, the other's income. Um, and and Shabana talked a little bit about this, um, but now countries are coming in with pillar two and saying, well, wait a minute. Um, if, if the other country is not taxing the income at a sufficient rate, why am I giving up my claim on that income? So Pillar 2 says that, that if a country is not taxing the income of a multinational at a sufficient level, other countries with a claim on that income, uh, either the parent jurisdiction or other jurisdictions where the group has um, operations, can impose a top-up tax uh, to bring the rate up to the minimum rate. Um, and one, one question actually from, from the audience um, is, what, what is the relationship between Pillar 2, the income inclusion rule, uh, and uh, or IIR and the U.S. guilty regime, um, and it's a little bit complicated because the um, we expect the guilty regime to change uh, based on some proposals from the Biden administration, uh, but but the IIR and the guilty are very similar, and in fact um, the IIR in Pillar Two was based on the guilty. Um, they're both CFC type taxes, so uh, they would tax the parent on the uh, low tax income of uh, its CFCs, um, but, but there are some differences. And the biggest one is really that um, the US guilty would allow, or does allow rather, uh, currently 
um, global blending of income of the CFCs, whereas the IIR is done on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. And the, the Biden administration is proposing to change guilty um, to align guilty more with the IIR to make it done on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. Um, but but the, the basic uh, upshot here is that, that um, as we talked about, both pillars one and uh, two would be significant and fundamental changes to the uh, international tax system. That's, that's interesting. And probably the G7 recently over the weekend, this is a major, major change. And we're going to see a lot of behavior changing through this and about uh, BEPS for, for the tax erosion, uh, profit erosion uh, tax. So in very simple for, in, in text, uh, Michael, I think, how this, what this means for our attendees in the region and, uh, and, and what they should be prepared for and specifically for the low income taxes as, as in simple term. I know this is evolving, but how our people will be ready. Right, absolutely. No, it is, it is evolving. The discussions are fluid, although, as you say, the G7 agreement um, does uh, provide a, a, a significant um, you know, milestone here. But let's start very quickly with, with Pillar 1. Um, because of the scope of a Pillar 1 as proposed is very narrow, it would just be the top 100 uh, multinationals. Uh, the impact would be limited to, to those groups. Um, and a key question here is, um, will there be an exception for financial institutions and extractive industries such as oil? Um, and uh, basically, we don't know at this point. Uh, the blueprint that came out in October said that they would be excluded. Um, the U.S. proposal seems to indicate that they would not be excluded. Um, but we understand there, there's currently debate about that. And, and so we'll just have to see how that plays out. Obviously, it's going to be very important for a number of, of people in the region. Uh, for Pillar 2, there are a lot of unknowns there as well as to how this will actually play out. Um, but let's just take a, a simple example as to how this would work. So let's say you've got a, a parent company in Germany and a subsidiary. It has a subsidiary in uh, a low tax jurisdiction such as Bahrain or, or Qatar. Um, and uh, the subsidiary's income is subject to a tax at less than, uh, let's say, a 15 percent rate based on the G7 agreement. In that case, uh, the German parent would pay a tax, an additional tax to Germany. Uh, to bring the tax on the subsidiary's income up to that 15% rate. On the flip side, if you had a um, the, the parent in a low tax jurisdiction and the subsidiary in Germany, what would happen is that the uh, German subsidiary would be denied deductions uh, again to bring up the tax uh, to top up the tax of the parent uh, based on that 15% rate. Um, so Pillar 2 sets up some, some interesting incentives. Um, if enough countries implement it, then most groups will pay the top of tax on all of their low tax income. And there, there still may be some incentives for, for countries to, to keep a low rate uh, or no corporate income tax, uh, but those incentives are going to be reduced uh, at the least. Interesting, very interesting, I think. Um, finally, last, last question, last comment, uh, Michael. Do we expect OECD and other countries to agree to this? And uh, what's expected timing for this to be on effect coming, on effect? And how this our, our people will be anticipated that? Sure, yeah, so as, we, as we've mentioned, the, the G7 actually did agree over the weekend on many of the key parameters of both pillars one and two, uh, including a minimum rate of 15% for pillar two and that the quantum uh, of reallocation of profits under pillar one. Now, of course, uh, that's not a guarantee that we'll see a, an agreement at the G20 or in the inclusive framework because the G7 is relatively homogeneous, right? It's the US, UK, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and Canada. Um, whereas the G20 and inclusive framework obviously have many different kinds of countries with lots of different um, uh, interests. So we'll have to see how that, that plays out. But my expectation is that they will announce a deal um, in July. We'll, we're likely to see a high level commitment um, in July in the, the G20 finance ministers meeting, uh, and then maybe a more comprehensive uh, deal uh, announced with the G20 leaders meeting in October. Now, the real question, as you note, is uh, which countries are going to implement this and when? 
Uh, for pillar one, that's going to require a multilateral treaty. Uh, that's going to take a while to get implemented. I would not expect that to come into effect until uh, probably 2024 at the earliest um, for a lot of countries. Pillar two is a little bit more complicated because um, countries can implement that on their own, at least major parts of it. Um, and in fact, the US is proposing to implement pillar two uh, for 2022. Um, other countries, you know, the EU has uh, said it will um, propose a directive on pillar two that might come into effect in 2023 or 2024. So at this stage, uh, there, there's a lot of uncertainty, but it, it does seem like these will be, uh, these reforms will be implemented in a lot of jurisdictions. And I think it's really important for companies to be trying to get their arms around, understand what the potential impact is going to be. Uh, modeling is going to be a really significant part of that. Um, and what we see actually with a number of clients is that um, more and more companies are starting to model the potential impacts, especially of pillar two, um, to determine, you know, what's the impact if I'm doing uh, an M&A transaction or doing uh, big internal restructuring at this stage, um, how do I do that in a way that is most likely to mitigate uh, some of these, these impacts of, of pillar two? Um, and if you can, you, you may also want to talk with policymakers in your jurisdiction to see how they're planning to address BEPS 2.0, and, and that can help you understand how this might play out for your group. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Michael, we know this is an uh, emerging and evolving issue, and uh, we're going to watch for that, honestly. I'm sure our people and our tax partners in the region. So thank you very much for your, your contribution and for the recent development in the G7 and about that. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, now we will come to end of our uh, tax summit. I'd like to thank uh, our uh, guest speakers. And on behalf of our partners, we'd like to thank uh, our uh, uh, guests also, all of them for all of you who, who participated and, and shared their questions. And uh, we are very happy and delighted uh, that conference is, 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 is being concluded and useful by your, part, by your participation. And we are looking forward to uh, say next year, hopefully our conference is gonna be physically, hope, inshallah, in Dubai and we'll meet you face to face. And at the end, please don't forget to fill out your and um, feedback, complete the, our feedback. It's very useful to us, the survey. And uh, the recording will be shared with you, inshallah, soon once we finish uh, our team uh, from the production. So thank you very much. I'd like to wish you all have a, a good evening and or good night. So it depends where are you. And looking forward to meeting you in person, inshallah, next year, hopefully, inshallah. Thank you very much and uh, uh, have a good day. Bye-bye.